Well, hello there, and welcome to the show that is Digital Foundry Direct 146. Um, big show today. Um, we're recording this directly in the aftermath of uh, Developer Underscore Direct uh, from Xbox, which I think was an excellent show. Uh, joining me to discuss it, first of all, uh, John Linneman. Yes, that's right. It's Xbox time. No, this is a this was a great show, like genuinely awesome. So I'm really happy to talk about it today. Mm -hmm. And uh, Alex Batalia. I would say based on all that 60 FPS footage, it was PC time, actually. <laughs> but uh, oh. oh, I said it. Mm. Uh, yeah, I'm excited. Oh. This was awesome. <laughs> Let's talk about this. this yeah. Um, uh, first of all, hats off uh, to Microsoft for just producing a show like this in the first place, I think. I mean, um, we've obviously been railing for many years against the sort of... Um, uh, well, we called it the trailerfication of uh, game reveals at you know, events like E3. And we kept saying, look, let the developers tell their stories, let them show their games. And um, they did it. <laughs> they went out and did it. And lo and behold, the format works and it's excellent. And uh, also, I think, uh, worthy of praise is um, the level of production values they put into it. It's, it's you know, it's a really well put together I, show. Yeah. When I look at those cameras that they're using and those lenses and the lighting, <laughs> yeah. I get I feel very envious, and I'm just like, oh. you get camera I mean, envy. I wish I had the ability and tools necessary to do that, but I'm just <laughs> yeah. one man. You, you also need a guy on the on the sidelines with a wobbly camera to get the uh, the side on shot there. <laughs> yeah. No, I I, I actually, would elevate I, our content to the next level. That's fun. I did that. I've done that before for, um, I can't remember what, there was some video where I set up a stationary cam and then I took the other one and was just walking around getting mm -hmm. like wobbly shots. That's, <laughs> that's what you do. You get multiple cameras going. It works. Yeah. I mean, obviously though, it, it sort of lives and dies by the quality of the content. And um, I think it's fair to say that kind of, as always, Microsoft had it all to prove and it had to be um, excellent quality games that we saw, and that is exactly what we got. It kind of ended with um, the reveal for the first time of the new Indiana Jones game by Machine Games, uh, executive produced by uh, Todd, Todd Howard himself. And um, let's talk about that one to begin with, because um, I guess it aligns most closely with what we tend to discuss. Um, Alex, I'm going to go to you first on this one, but I think overall, I mean, my first impressions on this one were... Um, it just looked tremendous. Excellent mm. choice of engine technology, obviously, in tech there. Um, it just looked really <laughs> sumptuous and inexpensive, really, <laughs> as a game. It just looked astonishingly good. It did. It was very, very well done on a lot of aspects. I also think uh, one thing that uh, the movies, the last two, have not really captured is like, you know, just kind of being. It looked simple. I don't know how to explain it. Like, it was like an Indiana Jones, like story just you know he doesn't need to be dealing with aliens he doesn't need to be time traveling it's oh just, but know, come like, on I, people were way too hard that, that last movie was kind of fun i, I mean if I, you I, like i didn't CGI, even make it through I, i'll be honest with you i, I, turned it off I could through. not do that i, I like cgi but <laughs> i mean I, I like cgi as much as the next person when i don't see it um so visibly oh, yeah, but either yeah. way um, cgi monkeys either. where do you stand on that <laughs> yeah, do you like the CGI monkeys, John? Um, no, okay, that that movie I don't like very much. The alien, yeah, uh, Crystal Skull, no, 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 Crystal Skull. But yeah, this, 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 that for that aspect, I was very, very happy with it. It's just like, and um, I think the choice of studio uh, for it is very good. Obviously, with the Wolfenstein games, uh, they yeah. have established that they know how to do the time period correctly. They know how to capture moods and things like that in a really good way. Um, uh, I think the the funny thing in the aftermath of it all is they immediately when they started talking about it they didn't say like you're not playing as Indiana Jones you are Indiana Jones and they really wanted to emphasize that it was going to be a first person experience with them <laughs> dialing the camera back a little bit uh, when you do I guess some of them it's hard to get a sense of how much platforming the game is actually going to have uh, based on the video and as well for cutscenes because watching Indiana Jones and Harrison Ford's um, character model there is part of the experience uh but i did think that was great for the studio to do because uh being first person it's something that the studio has done ever since they were originally starbreeze and then kind of transferred into what machine games was and that's what they're comfortable with that's how they make their games they know how to make them that well that way and you know in a genre of action adventure games which i think this indiana jones game is going to be 
with some puzzles. It seems like they did actually talk a lot about the puzzles. Um, I think it's going to be unique in the genre as a result of that. And uh, we've already played games like Tomb Raider before or Uncharted, and we know what those are like. So seeing them do it from a different perspective here without that baggage, I'm very happy about it. I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah, so 100% on board. Um, so as you say, uh, Machine Games is largely formed by many people that had previously worked for Starbreeze, though obviously they've expanded and changed since then. Uh, but the director on this game, I believe, was the director on uh, the Riddick game, uh, the original, and uh, The Darkness, both okay. of which are excellent. And you absolutely can see the influence here in this footage, specifically the, the moment that there's two things that really stood out. First of all, the hand-to-hand -hand melee combat. <laughs> Plus, of course, the whip that's extremely Riddick in a way that's it, it had that sort of impact where they really nailed that first person brawling mechanic. Uh, but also when they specifically highlighted, oh, and we cut to third person for certain actions, such as climbing. You guys remember, of course, that's <laughs> yeah. exactly how it works in Riddick, where they would cut out the third person for specific actions like that. Uh, so to me, in my head, I'm thinking like, OK, this is this is actually like a spiritual follow up to that game. Uh, which we've not seen games quite like that in a while. Uh, and that Riddick also being sort of a film property, right? So the combination of all of this together, this feels like that's what they're making. And I think yeah. that's great. This sort of first person -y adventure action game that's not explicitly a shooter. Uh, I'm sure there will be some shooting in this game, but it's clearly not the focus. And I think the whip stuff looks awesome in first person. And I'll be oh, curious yeah. to see how it actually plays out. But yeah, there's the melee stuff. There's the the puzzle solving. Actually, the melee, some things about the melee that also stood out is like they have moments where he'll actually grab an enemy and like grabbing them in first person almost kind of, I, I almost wonder if it'll have some sort of Doom style uh, influence, you know, mm. with the, what are they called? The uh, glory kills. Brutal, the glory kills, right? where you kind of like can trigger an equivalent in this game, grab a guy by the collar and then like wail on him and then throw him back into the scene. Like there's a lot of potential for that kind of cool interactivity there. And yeah. beyond that, of course, you know, so visually, I think it looks generally quite good. I saw some complaints around the character models and I can kind of see the mm -hmm. issue there. I think the character models are good, but not like, they're not at the level of some other big trip away games. Right. And that's, well, I don't think that's a big problem, but I, I think it is mainly, it's mainly like the indie character model and a little bit of the eyes. Like there's, there is definitely a lack of subsurface getting based upon whatever yeah. they're doing with their lighting. I think mainly it's actually a lighting setup issue and not a, like an asset. Sure. Issue. Sure. Sure. Um, oh, well, I, but, I mean, I think some of the faces look a little weird in terms of the way they're designed, but I think, I, but I think that's but, mainly indie, though. Yeah, I, you're right. That actually might just be a an uncanny, uh, uncanny <laughs> valley. I could call it uncanny for short. Sure, actually. do it. Uncanny valley kind of thing where we're used to seeing what Harrison Ford in indie looks like, and since they're going for his likeness, any differentiation stands out as being strange. So you're probably yeah. right about that. But I think it's mostly a lighting issue. Whereas is, is the rest of the scene, I think, looks phenomenal. This is the yeah. first indie game that actually has his likeness, isn't it? In, actually in game i in mean game i, I would say so. that they've tried to have his likeness in the past i mean you go back to n64 pc right in the 90s uh with that third person tomb raider like game that they made um blanking on the name uh, uh played, the, so. the infernal machine yeah it's the uh, infernal machine i mean he was clearly designed to look like indiana jones harrison ford but the technology was of course <laughs> limited <laughs> and then um, there was also the Xbox game, which I did a video on uh, some years back, which mm -hmm. which was really cool. Uh, and I think in all cases, they were trying to go for that look, but the technology wasn't there. Mm. Right. But um, so one thing actually, so even though I think the, the, the model and some of the animation quality for the Indiana Jones character model is a bit off putting because of the fact that we're so like john said we're so i know exactly i know these movies by heart like i know exactly the way harrison ford looks and so seeing it looking slightly different and then moving in a more animatronic way it is off-putting to say the least um but there are some things like that i thought in the initial when the i don't know what the big baddie's name is i forget his name all of a sudden uh but there are some really cool things in terms of animation detail that are really great on the main character like 
um like when he's like looking down at indy's like head <laughs> buried in the desert <laughs> uh, you can see there's like mo- moisture collecting on his nose and it drops off yep, multiple yep. times also when he is opening his mouth so, sorry Al, we're gonna have to do this um you can see the spittle between his lips going like <laughs> stretching going up and down it's really really cool <laughs> Uh, yeah, like little, and then when he exasperates and says like the word forgotten, also a bunch of spit comes out. So they are spending a lot of time and attention to detail there, I think, for like the custom character models uh, that are more, I would say, like either unknown actors and actresses uh, that we are not used to seeing. And there you don't see some of the uncanny effects more. Yeah, it's just, right. I think it really is uh, some of that lighting setup, which is giving everyone like a very specular sheen on their, on their skin. I, I would imagine there is probably actual subsurface scattering there, but it's maybe being buried by the lighting setup. And then I think it's just in, you know, Harrison Ford himself. Uh, it, that's, I don't know how you do it uh, without, Sp- uh, spilling millions of dollars into this and doing something absolutely no one's ever seen it before. Like this. But it, I, yeah, I, yeah. I would also say that it has, it's going for that sort of like hyper realism look where it's not exactly targeting photo realism, right? It's, it's clearly a, a stylistic looking game. And I, so it does have a little bit of that going on, which I think is probably the right choice for this. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially if you're trying to pull off a likeness like that, if you make him a little more stylized, perhaps it stands out less, but yeah either way that's that's a minor thing in the grand scheme of things and the rest of this looks great and being id tech that also means i think we can safely assume that the console versions will also be 60 frames per second i type so uh, yeah like i can't imagine them building a game in this engine and not targeting that right that mm-hmm. that would mm-hmm. be i yeah. mean even uh remind me i mean like wolfenstein 2 and everything i believe all of those games were Absolutely. aiming for 60 yeah. even on older machines so I think, yeah. yeah, I think it was only the id Tech 5 Wolf game that was, like, unlocked 60. Like, like it was, like, in the 40s on, like, the... There was a PS3, Xbox 360 version of that, oh, wasn't there? Oh, yeah. I don't think that was a capped 30 game, though. I don't call. I think the only older id Tech game that ran really badly was uh, The Evil Within. Yeah, that that's a, a good one. Right. It was a gosh darn mess, but... Uh, <laughs> that's such a weird else, game. <laughs> I love that game, but yeah. Yeah, technically it's very poor. Uh, I've got a few notes um, based on what I saw, and uh, but overall I just thought it looked absolutely fantastic. I was really intrigued by their um, ideas that um, uh, confrontations may actually have different ways through. You don't necessarily yes, yes. need combat. I mean, if you watch the Indiana Jones movies, combat is kind of like last resort almost. Mm-hmm. You know, the guy uses his head to, to get through these situations more and his, his guile... Um, mm. much more than his fists generally. I thought that was, they, they highlighted that and I was really quite excited by that to see how it's actually going to work out. Um, and um, yeah, the puzzle solving side, side of things. I mean, there are a lot of sort of callbacks, echoes to the classic Indiana Jones uh, movies, you know, the Staff of Ra, that kind of thing. That's the sort of puzzling I'd really like to see. And and it's kind of the sort of thing that Uncharted and whatnot have tried to, to do over the years. Um, from uh, a law perspective, uh, it, it made me laugh that, well, first of all, they had the logos of the various movies come up. It started off with Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, which annoyed me a bit because that's kind of like the, the, the latter day name of the movie. Oh, uh, yeah. Exactly. Raiders yeah. of the Lost Ark. But then they did uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, Last Crusade. <laughs> but then it stops there. You didn't get the, lo- <laughs> you didn't get the logos for Crystal Skull and uh, was it the Dial of Destiny? Just like, yep, yeah, okay, this is... And no the, mention of young Indiana Jones, jeez. Yeah, this, well, I mean, well, this is the thing, right? This is what I find really exciting about it, is that, you know, they've placed it in the timeline between Raiders and Last Crusade. And this is a luxury that the movies don't have because they have to accommodate an older Harrison Ford, in, mm-hmm. in, you know, if they're right. going to do a new movie. They can just place it square within the classic um, era. You know, India is high, it is prime. And that's what really excites me about this. And you've got the globe trotting, and you've got the scrolling map with the red line. <laughs> the you most do. important thing. Which is, At 60 know, frames cru- per second, no less. Yeah, <laughs> crucial to Indiana Jones lore. So they get it, right? That's what really excites me about this. They get it, and they get the wires cracking. You know, um, shame you couldn't have Harrison Ford, but Troy Baker's doing a pretty good job with, uh, uh, with, his, sti- with his stylings. Yeah. So you know, uh, I think uh, having Harrison Ford probably would have been a mistake, given that well, trying he to sounds bring, older. 
Yeah, he sounds, sounds older, like an older and also bringing Hollywood actors in, unless they're seriously familiar with like the way voice acting for games <laughs> can work. I feel like they might get frustrated, and you may not get the performance you want out of it. Part time, uh, yeah, or or the uh, the old Kiefer Sutherland problem where it's like you know, yeah. uh, Solid Snake, or sorry, I guess it was Big Boss. Oh my god, basically a mute in the Phantom Pain. <laughs> yeah, kept you waiting. You didn't. Yeah, that that was never a good one. I I agree. I think yeah, like. Rich said, "I was. I'm actually super excited for this game. I like their the the previous studios' work. I'm a little bit less fan of TNC, uh, the new Colossus, for a number of reasons. Uh, but I hope they, like, balancing the encounters is actually one of the hardest things. And Rich talked about like that, like where you don't want to force the player character to do too many things because you want some versatility in these encounters to actually be indie, not just punching and shooting Nazis all day, but moving around stealthily and silently where." He's not a one on army. Um, so I'm, I'm very curious to see how they're going to balance that. Also, the size of the areas. There was like they showed an area. I think it was in Egypt where they show like guard dogs walking around at one point. I'm very curious about the actual size of like the uh, areas you are walking right, through. Right. Uh, or if it's more like, uh, I don't know, like the areas of like Tomb Raider and Uncharted where like those are like kind of like small little areas when the enemies come up. Like they're a little bit more free form when you're platforming and puzzling but then when the areas where the enemy's coming up you can see like the chest high walls starting to like appear and things like that so i'm, I'm just very curious to see how they're going to design this all yeah i mean I'm, I'm hoping for this sort of wide linear approach that i'm so fond of where it's still a linear game but parts of the level are rather open-ended and designed to allow experimentation playfulness uh that's kind of the the whole design of crisis which we often talk about where that's not an open world game it is effectively a wide linear experience and it mm -hmm. sort of rewards varied styles of play and i don't expect it to be that vast but based on what they're saying here and their history of doing varied gameplay design i think we should see something like that mm -hmm. uh, yeah. so i only have we'll one see. criticism at this point and maybe it's minor or maybe it's nothing but uh you know the the skywalker sound indiana jones uh punching sound effect yeah so it didn't seem to be the one that was in the game maybe i'm oh wrong. yeah i know that one <laughs> yeah. but that is that is like also a pretty crucial part of the indiana jones experience <laughs> yeah but that really is literally so all i could i mean this was the most exciting game review i've i can remember for a long long time i thought it was absolutely fantastic yeah because they did i feel like we knew about its existence but they when they revealed it for the first time they just came out full on with this showcase mm -hmm. and gives you a lot of information on it and kind of gets you excited and this is exactly the type of game that let's let's be honest we haven't really seen xbox focus on for a long time mm -hmm. this is this is something that we've been wanting and asking for uh, and I'm really happy that they're finally. What, what would be the last one? Like, like when they licensed in Rise of the Tomb Raider, perhaps? Because yeah, you know. I mean, because Halo is yeah. not Halo used to be a big single player thing, but Infinite didn't really right man it didn't pull that all the way off. You know, uh, a lot of the other stuff it's either multiplayer centric, a very different style of game, yeah. or something else entirely. Like, and, yeah, obviously Starfield is a single player game, but it's also like a. A, a, oh yeah, a big o open world. It's a Bethesda thing. game. It's a Bethesda that's, that's game. It's not that, this. You know, that's not to say there's anything wrong with those. It's great to have that kind of stuff, but I feel like this is the type of experience that they've Xbox has been missing in their wheelhouse, mm -hmm. and it's uh, and they used to deliver on this big time uh, mm -hmm. in the past, but now I'm happy that they have at least actually multiple, I guess, kind of in the works. Yeah, mm -hmm. some technical things I noted. Um, there doesn't appear to be so. The, the last game they made was uh, the Young Young Blood was yeah. it mm -hmm. Wolfenstein was Young Blood Wolfenstein entirely Youngblood. them or was uh, that's also with uh, Arcane a bit it was yeah. co-developed um, but that with had Arcane, yeah. RT reflections in it uh, it was like semi Nvidia sponsored I know Nvidia engineers were on site no. um, but there's a scene in the trailer I've got these notes sorry here at Z uh, where is it zero fifty six where the uh, one woman is talking with Indy, I, I don't know the her mm -hmm. his counterpart who I'm excited to meet. Um, uh, the, right there's a mirror, I believe, behind them. It might be a mirror. It looked like a mirror, polished mirror or something like that. Uh, no RT reflections on that. Uh, so maybe the game doesn't have uh, RT in this first showing. Maybe it will later. That, uh, that would be a bummer though, because aside from Youngblood, uh, 
id tech 7 itself has excellent and very fast ray tracing capabilities that we For saw sure. in doom eternal right and that yeah. ran beautifully on consoles as well so yeah so i guess we'll see obviously there's there's probably a lot more going on here than at an eternal i think visually uh, so maybe they, they did have to make some sort of, or maybe it's just not ready for the trailer. Uh, yeah. And also there's a shot at, excuse me, I'm trying to find where I read it, 053. So it's right before that. So 53 seconds into the trailer, not the direct thing, uh, where <laughs> there are some obvious shadow maps. So on the table, like undersampled things lacking uh, pixel yeah, yeah, perfect shadows. So um no good evidence of any ray tracing at all. In fact, I would I would be surprised if uh, they were doing any sort of ray trace lighting. At least in this trailer, it looked a lot like the their old approach, which was light maps yep. plus mm -hmm. uh, direct shadows. So uh, very excited though. Still, even regardless, sixty FPS first person Indiana Jones. This sounds awesome. Hey, they okay. picked their target for what they what they want to do visually, and they're going for it, and they're doing so with a high performance target as well. So. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's enough. Not everything needs to push the boundaries. Uh, and I think this looks really good with a lot of traditional techniques. So I'm happy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, well, let's move on to the next game we saw. Okay, so um, Developer Direct 2024 also gave us another look at um, Hellblade 2 from Ninja Theory, uh, being developed up there in Cambridge, not a million miles away from where I live. Mm. Um, and... Hmm, interesting one, this one, because um, it's still slightly enigmatic about what's actually happening, happening in the game, right? We've seen combat, we've seen a cutscene, we've seen entering and exiting a cave. <laughs> True, I've seen that. <laughs> we've seen this now. Um, John, what more did we learn about the game from uh, developer underscore direct? Uh, I mean, I feel like this... They finally, I guess they would. They have showed more of the environment and the world yeah. that you, that you'll explore in this game uh, compared to prior showings, because this is a strange one in that they've shown they've been showing this game since 2019, was it? Yeah. Uh, but I feel, and maybe this is not a bad thing, but it feels like we don't really know much about it because you know the gameplay reveal was, as Richard pointed out, you walk into a cave, watch a cutscene, and then you leave the cave, uh, and you're like, okay, but. Uh, yeah, this one, this video actually showed some proper combat and I was happy to hear that they specifically noted that the combat system has been changed. It's new revised, uh, which is cool because it combat played well in the original, but it was extremely straightforward. And by the end, it felt as if you were doing exactly the same thing, uh, throughout the entire game. And I'm hoping that there's a little bit more nuance to the actual play and say what you will about. Uh, their DMC game, which has many of its own issues, the actual core mechanics in that, I think were generally pretty darn good. Uh, they did a nice job there, so I would like to see them leverage a little bit more of that level of combat yeah. in this mm -hmm. game. And we'll mm -hmm. see what happens. It's difficult to say. Uh, I. It's interesting, though, hearing... I, the original is such a weird experience and it's one of those games it's one of the few games that really pushed binaural audio as a means of conveying information to the player i mean i assume you guys have tried that with headphones right yeah it's fantastic yeah, yeah they're doubling Good. down on it with this one i think that's really cool like i've i am a proponent of home theater setups and such but this is definitely one series uh that i think really celebrates a different form of audio thanks to headphones and anybody can enjoy it and binaural audio for those not familiar uh it's typically so when recorded with a binaural microphone you would physically have a a dummy head with physicalized ear canals and the mics are placed in that and it's to simulate the way sound bounces around inside your ear uh, and when the mic records that and you play it back through headphones, it can actually recreate that effect uh, in just with a sound file, no special hardware for the user or anything. It's literally just headphones. Yeah. And this is how they were able to accomplish that sort of the voices in the head stuff. Mm -hmm. Although I, I'm curious... I'm happy that they're able to sort of double down on that because it does look like a rather tortured game and it's the kind that's not going to appeal to everyone. So it's, <laughs> but like, which I think yeah. is cool that Microsoft's allowing a big game on their console that they've been pitching for years uh, to explore the space. 
I was talking to a friend about this and he was like, Oh, I'm not interested in, I was like, wait, really? Why? And they're like, well, it just, the original was, it's just a game you play that, that wants to make you feel like garbage. It's like, what, like what? It's like basically the whole point is simulating a person who has, who's going through a very difficult time and right. it puts you in this headspace of feeling terrible. And it's like, when you think about it that way, that's what they're doing. And that's, and they were pretty darn effective at that. But that's not like a mass market thing. So, uh, you know, respect for being able to produce something like this as a first party release. I think right. that is cool, even if it's not for everyone. Uh, but so beyond all that, though, and we'll talk more about this. This is an Unreal Engine 5 game, as we know. And I do think what they've shown visually is excellent and probably one of the best things we've seen from any first party studio yet. Uh, just in terms of character rendering and some of the effects and lighting. I mean, it looks very, very nice. There's that scene where one of the enemies sort of blows fire towards mm. Senua. I just, I love the way that that looks. Uh, it's just, it it looks more filmic, right? It's a yeah. very soft game. Uh, they're using a lot of VFX. It kind of reminds me of an even more realistic take on uh, A Plague Tale Requiem. Mm -hmm. Right. You know what I mean? Okay. With that extremely yeah. dense geometric uh terrain and lots of fine granular detail everywhere and like very realistic lighting although i think the animation of the characters here is probably beyond what we saw in plague tale mm -hmm. uh so all of that stuff i'm i think this will be a very cool experience which is something i am looking for and yeah. it is interesting that they confirmed it to be a similar length to the original which at first i was like wait they've spent like six years making this but at the same time, I tend to prefer smaller games as well. So, and I don't think a 20, 40 to 40 hour game of having voices in your head would be all that uh, palatable. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. So, so maybe so much this is the right choice. You can exactly, do exactly. So I, I'm still very excited for it. I don't know. What do you guys think? I was expecting uh, maybe a larger game just by virtue of the title you know, Senua's right. Saga. It kind exactly. of suggested something a bit more expansive and, and larger. Um, I, I don't really... Here's the thing, right? I still don't really know what to expect from this game. I mean, if we look, take a look at what we saw gameplay-wise in this particular uh, developer underscore direct, it was basically, you know, some walking forwards, some environment shots and some combat. Yep. We still don't really have... You know, how does it play? What happens in a general level? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm right. suspecting it's going to be much the same as the first one based on what we've seen so far, but with everything amped up from a visual and um, audio perspective. And that's fine, I guess. Um, just not quite what I was expecting. But it, at least things are becoming clearer now. And the release date isn't so far away, May 21st. Right, right. I called dibs on it. Okay. Please, recovering. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, on a technical level, there's two things that I thought were interesting. One is the aspect ratio. They nice. keep showing the game in what looks to be 21 by nine. At this like point, the order. I think it's gonna be an order 1886 situation where they're using black bars to get more power out of that Xbox Series X there. Um, and that's how they're able to push up the visuals. Uh, you know, we saw it also technically with the matrix. Um, yeah. Also, Demo. Death Stranding, the, the PS5 version of that had, right. a, ver, had a wide ultra wide mode that expanded the FOV, but it was also like native one one 4K pixel, in terms right? of pixel rendering, right? Right, yeah. exactly. So I think that's what we're going get, to be getting here on Xbox now, based upon the fact that they keep showing it this way. If they if they did it, like, it would be so weird if the Xbox version came out and was suddenly 16 by 9. But um, I I'm also uh, did see some TSR breakup. Uh, specifically in the shot where John talked about the uh, the, fire. the fire that's so like TSR yeah. has an issue where with particles that are transparent they do like a ghosty kind of image on them so uh, we saw a version of the game that was running TSR UE5 that I mean I don't want to say this is the console version this was also a only 30 FPS footage I think we saw the entire time yeah uh, there were some moments in the Avowed trailer that were 30, but I think they I were think... slowed down. Um, you know, so I think this could 
could be a good target of what we see on the series consoles there visually I, alex what do you of... think about this though this is a game when i look at this running at 30 frames per second with the quality of the motion blur and the post-process heavy image where i actually think it looks pretty good at 30 i and think given it would fine the, the slow nature of it i feel like it's <sighs> an acceptable choice in this case i mean i mean for yeah for for me like i would still play at a higher frame rate but i think this is one of those games where the gameplay <laughs> like rich said we still have seen so little like i, know, I don't I think know. the gameplay is requiring anything no. <laughs> that looks like a hardcore 60 fps plus experience is required this here counter strike this is not, sorry this Will. is not your counter strike Will's Will. not gonna play it yeah <laughs> well not playing it <laughs> <laughs> counter terrorists like it's, what it's are no they valorant using? that's either so it's no valorant so um <laughs> <laughs> Poor Will. Uh, yeah, I, so, I mean, we'll see here when it comes out. It's also going to be very interesting to see what the Hex Series S is going to look like, all things considered. Blurry. Very blurry, I presume. Maybe uh, very ultra-wide aspect ratio. <laughs> it's just like a... It's like, 32 yeah, by 9. 32 baby. by 9 in there. That's how they do it. That'd be that would be so funny. Um, <laughs> Make a giant hood under it just to, just for good measure. It will be fine. I think generally is the Yeah, I, I do yeah, hope though in fine. terms of accessibility options, uh it's a little bit hard, but the game I could imagine could turn people off due to how post processing heavy it is. Uh, I think it would be nice to allow people to adjust motion blur strength and maybe adjust whether or not chromatic aberration and right. um barreling distortion barreling is occurring for that lens because the game's got all of that in there the first game kind of did too but it'd yeah. be nice to seeing those things especially on the pc version being toggleable it yeah. might have a performance mode i mean the first game had several modes so right you know, we, yep. we just don't know at this we'll point see. and yeah. you know a performance mode would make the series s port uh, at 30 easier i guess in an yeah. alan wake style true right mm-hmm. Okay, anything more about Hellblade 2? I guess yeah, we don't so have to wait too long until we see it. The, fi- the final point to lay down, and this thinking of those black bars and The Order 1886, my prediction is that this is the Xbox's The Order 1886. Right. Okay, cool. And when I say that, that is not negative. I covered that game last year as sort of a retrospective, right? Yeah. And frankly, I thought it was really enjoyable. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, it has a lot of limitations. It's a small game. It, you know, I mean... I hope this doesn't have the same sort of cliffhanger aspect of the order because that was actually <laughs> disappointing because the story was getting good and then it yeah. just kind of ends, right? But everything else, uh, the order is a fairly linear, straightforward, experience-driven game. The core mechanics, the gunplay, are actually very solid and competent, but not like you know genre-defining. Uh, and it tells its story well with memorable sort of sequences, characters, and it has the same sort of very filmic look with a lot of post-processing, really, really strong motion blur and uh, animation work. And so basically that's kind of what I think we're seeing here is a game of that style more than anything else. And when you think about it like that, I mean, I view that as a positive thing. Some people might say, well, that's not good, but I, I still think the order... It's pretty all right. I like it. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, let's move on to the next title. Okay. So, um, yeah, Developer Direct uh, 2024 also gave us a good look at Ara, the new game from Oxide Games. Uh, previously uh, did Ashes the Singularity, but they were talking up more their uh, civilization credentials, I think. Wait, um, real quick, Rich. Was Ashes of the Singularity actually a game or was it a benchmark? <laughs> <laughs> it was a game. It was a game, John. <laughs> It was a game, John. Even though, it's one of those funny things where it launched as a benchmark first before it even launched as a game. I'm pretty sure AOTS okay. did. Okay. Um, the reason why I'm excited about this is, one, I thought technologically there was a lot going on here that we haven't seen the studio uh, really do with their most recent technology, at least in a while. Uh, and you can really, like, there's a lot going on. They mentioned, like... Um, like a level of proceduralism in the game world yeah. where you're, I mean, all these type of like grand strategy esque, you know, single player or even multiplayer adventures, like when you go through them, the, there's a large level of reactivity in the world over time. But here it actually showing up in like the way, like the land about you, the way it looks 
and the, like the things that the vegetation and animals that might be there that are also affecting like the commerce and the way you interact. There's a lot going on here that I can barely cap encapsulate in a couple sentences, but this looks like an extremely ambitious title in its genre. Um, it seems to be doing a lot of uh, like micromanagement combat it appeared to be in there as well too. A lot of city and diplomacy uh, management uh, as well as some, you know, like smaller things. Um, like they mentioned like uh, that even like the 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 wild animals are going to like interact with your villagers at like the earlier stages of the game which is a lot more something you'd see in a, in like a smaller scale strategy game like age of empires um so there's a lot going on there in terms of what they're trying to do in the genre itself it seems like a very ambitious title uh but i also thought technologically this is one of really really good looking rts game i think one of the cool things that they've always done uh probably since ashes of the singularity is they've really pushed a unique engine directive like for that for ashes of the singularity they were going for like texture space shading running on the gpu msaa resolve no taa really uh and like a very unique way to do rendering to reduce aliasing and I think since then they've changed things up. Like the engine for a long time was like one of the first adopters of DX12, Vulcan, and even Mantle back yeah, in the Mantle, day, if yeah. you recall. Uh -huh. uh, and since then they there was a blog post by I think their TD describing how they moved the backed off of DX12 and low-level APIs for a while because it was like a, like a management nightmare for them to make it just as fast always as they wanted and supporting the hardware all the various hardwares that they wanted to get into the game so they did back off and go dx11 for a while too so i'm very curious to see what this title is technologically and it's also been a an a, a, one of the few titles that you can actually show like with ashes of singularity like you can actually show multi-core scaling really well it's one of the few 4k benchmarks that is still cpu limited usually yeah. Um, so I, I'm excited for this as a tech reviewer, as well as someone who loves RTS games. And I'm very happy that it got the same level of attention and detail as like your super console-ified games like, you know, Hellblade 2 there. Like Microsoft views their platform as one that covers multiple, you know, not just consoles. It's also PCs in there. And this is definitely a PC game. I would be very, very surprised if this was coming out on Xbox anytime soon. Yeah, so the, uh, the interface would be impenetrable. <laughs> you'd be, you'd just be completely out of it. John, are you going to play it on your? Uh, are you loading up oh. AOTS on your? Uh... Sorry, I was. Um, <laughs> did you know that Half Life One looks really good on the deck OLED? It does. Uh, well, not on the OLED. No, I've sorry, only played I, it on I, the original. I'm just, I'm just teasing. I, I kind of zoned out just because I'm like, yeah, this is a game. <laughs> this is not okay this is not the game type of game i traditionally would play but i agree with your sentiment there at the end that i think it's very cool that in a first party showcase they're effectively showing a very pc centric style strategy game uh which has a different sort of audience and giving them that kind of airtime and that sort of attention that's awesome that's well really cool. if you think about it this is basically the perfect format for, for that particular yeah, game developer direct because um you know what would you get instead if this was in like the e3 showcase you'd get like what, oh my gosh you know, a 90 second trailer or something which would tell you nothing about the game and here you've actually got the people making the game telling you you know why you should be excited about it and it was wasn't treated like a second class citizen alongside the likes of you know indiana jones and hellblade 2 it was right in the thick of it and i think the other triumph of it was that the the uh the segment even if you weren't particularly interested in rts games you know you kept watching because it was compelling to watch it was you know it's good stuff yeah yeah, it was, so yeah think, it's people who are passionate about their jobs talking about why they think their game is special and people from a variety yep, of disciplines yep. too actually every one of the direct so showcases uh except for maybe i can't remember the visions uh of mana if they had a multiple people there i think that was mainly just the yeah, they had a couple. director they had a couple uh but like most of them had uh like a variety of people from a variety of disciplines talking about like things in the game and obviously they are scripted there you don't want people just freewheeling uh for this to, uh developer underscore direct but you know 
they said something about why they cared about their game and what makes it special. So for this one, RTS genre lover, a variety of different RTS games, this put it right on my radar, more actually so than their previous titles. I'm very excited for this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about it as, as well. And certainly from a technical perspective, you know, Dan Baker, who mm-hmm. uh, really did uh, some fantastic work with Ashes of the, the Singularity, um, you know, he's he's back I'd really love to, for us to speak to him about what they're doing with Isla. Mm-hmm. Fingers crossed there. Um, and, but let's move on. Uh, so developer underscore delay 24 scored another hit, I think, with the surprise reveal of an Xbox version of Visions of Mana. Um, it's a game that isn't actually... Uh, it's, it's coming fairly soon, I think. And um, I think this was, yet again, another triumph. John, um, just mm. in terms of quality of presentation, um, styling... This just looked really, really great, I thought. Oh, gosh, yeah, the actual present. The the sequence, first of all, the sequence within the direct here, the way it was filmed and presented, I thought was exceptionally well done. Probably mm-hmm. the best of the bunch. Uh, really cool. But also, I, I thought it was nice that they were able to get Square Enix included in this presentation because it's the type of presentation we don't see that often from them. You know, where it's right, absolutely. sort of visit to the studio, look at people working on things. Uh, and it's nice to have footage of that and sort of more of a discussion on what they're trying to do with it. And it also kind of feels like a bit of a we've made up kind of thing with Square Enix. Not that Square hasn't published games on Xbox. They certainly have done that, but it does give me some hope that they've sort of uh, corrected their seemingly visible relationship issues. I, I don't know a good way to describe that, but you you know the sentiment, right? Where it just right. it felt it felt like Square was kind of skipping out on Xbox a lot in recent years. Yeah, uh, and this kind of feels between this and Final Fantasy fourteen, it feels like a nice turn for them, sort of targeting more platforms, including Xbox. Uh, and this is a game that I am extremely interested in as a longtime fan of Seiken Densetsu. It's a mm-hmm. uh, I don't know this this is probably to Alex as the prior game was to me where it's like you're this is not a game you're interested in. That looks in, visually awesome. I thought it was I love incredible. I love this and I think this is this is neat that they're reviving the series again. This is an actual new entry. It's it's basically the fifth game, you could say. I mean, they've made many more titles in the series, but they've all been kind of spin-offs, remakes to a certain point. Uh, and I like the visual style they're going for here. I think it's bright, colorful. Uh, the characters are well shaded and realized. They have that cartoony look to them, but it's it's like s- almost cell shading, but mm-hmm. not exactly, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but the the world itself, uh, there's there's a surprising amount of detail in those backgrounds, despite the bright sort of color. It kind of reminds me of what was done with Dragon Quest Eleven on right. Unreal Engine back in the day. I assume this is Unreal Engine. I uh, think it would be too. So I think the remake of the third game was also Unreal Engine, which is Trials of Mana. Mm-hmm. Uh, this looks noticeably better than that, though, and I think it's partially due to the fact that Trials was sort of adhering to uh, what was effectively a pixel art grid-based design and translating that into 3D, where this is a, an original game so they can create environments that take full advantage of 3D. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, that's there, there that's seems to cool be a stuff. focus in the segment, which was about okay, you know, how do you make pixel art uh, work in a three D way, and um, you know, actually showcasing the monsters and the animations and whatnot that's showed. Yep, yep. it was it was Great. really quite compelling stuff. And that's that is something key to a lot of these Japanese RPG style games is that the enemies themselves are. Uh, almost as important as the characters to a degree in terms of their iconography and the way they're represented, right? Mm -hmm. And I think you really see that here with a lot of that attention to detail poured into the individual animations, their silhouettes, their color choices. It all works really well. Uh, Absolutely. And it sounds like this game's coming out in the summer this year. Interesting, okay. I also, oh, I also like the segment here on the, the... on the sound design because the this is another thing the series is well known for it's it's soundscape which uh yeah i I expect great great music here but Mm -hmm. yeah i I wonder if i i didn't see if they mentioned who was doing the music but it would Mm, be nice to see if uh hiroki kikuta was Mm -hmm. involved who was the composer for the original 
super well for the second game on the Super NES Secret of Mana, which was actually Sicken Densetsu 2. Well, there was uh, an emphasis on like the legacy credentials of this release. Right. Yes, that's right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, do you guys have anything to say on this? Or? Uh, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, John, despite what you're saying, I'm actually excited for this based upon the direct. Wow. Uh, I think it looks beautiful. That's cool. I, I liked the emphasis on tying back to a series with epic roots goes back really far uh and then maintaining that the only thing is i actually do love turn-based gameplay and i really love turn-based gameplay (laughs) people i know that people don't like it um i love it too but this series has always been action right okay so yeah so like uh, that's the only thing like where i like no like i'm not i'm not super into um Sorry, uh, there's no really good way to say it, but like JRPGs that are real time, I haven't really been able to get myself into them always. Uh, but maybe this will be an exception to the rule where I feel uh, engrossed in it enough because I thought the world looked so great. Um, so I, w- I just want, I also want to see it running on my system. And it is a PC. I'd look, just looked it up. It's coming out at least on Steam, even, uh, which is great. Uh, so I'll be looking forward to seeing that. And maybe we can, when John covers this, I can do a little excourse in his video about it that would be fun i was uh it would never happen but i was kind of like secretly wishing we would see a cameo from uh, nazir gabelli uh in this video he's long out of games but nazir uh uh, was he was famous for basically being the original programmer of final fantasy the iranian the iranian american guy guy. legendary in the apple ii scene and he did amazing work on the Famicom and Super Famicom. And he was the programmer of Secret of Mana, which mm. uh, famously was originally a Super NES CD game that they had to nice. strip back when that add-on was canceled. Wow. Uh, and you, you can kind of feel it in the final product, even though it's still good. But, I man, yeah, that's uh, it's quite a legacy this, this series has. Okay, good stuff. Uh, let's move on to the final game. So yeah, Developer Direct 2024 Avowed was the first title that was revealed and um, yeah, Obsidian, we got to see inside their HQ, got to see the game running and I think we have saw pretty much more of it than we have in the past. Um, I don't really know what to make of this one, John. Um, it did seem yeah. to be sort of typical sort of Obsidian fare, but very well delivered, I thought. Uh, for starters, I would like to compliment the artist of the key art that was presented with the Avowed <laughs> logo. Right. This sort of like skeleton figure um, that's kind of rotting away with this sort of plant life springing forth from his corpse. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a disturbing image in a positive way that I really like. Uh, so that's really cool. And it sort of sets the tone for what they're going for, I think, visually here, which is it's a fantasy world. It's a fantasy RPG but it has more of a, I guess, it kind of is going for a unique style that's a little different from what they've done before while still feeling decidedly Obsidian. And of course, these guys are well known for their work on New Vegas. They did the Outer Worlds. Uh, Obsidi- Wait, Obsidian did Pentiment, didn't they? Yeah. Which, which was different really... Different yeah. Different team. Yeah. That was really interesting as well. Very different style of game. But this is kind of like... Uh, a return to this sort of like fan- fantasy kind of style, I guess. I don't know. It's hard to make much out of the gameplay. It's just, it looks like an action RPG. And I assume with what we're seeing from the dialogue system that it will carry much of the storytelling and excellent dialogue that we expect from an Obsidian game forward. Uh, I will say, visually speaking, it looks pretty good. I believe it's Unreal Engine 5. Yep. The hair yes. rendering stood out to me as being excellent with a lot of fine grain detail in the hair and you could almost see like the little bit of fuzz along each each lock of hair in a way that felt pretty realistic and natural. Uh, they're also doing some unique skin types on these characters, which is decidedly not human. Right. Uh, but still manages to look fairly realistic. It's well lit, well shadowed. Uh, the It would seem that we're definitely seeing Lumen and Nanite used here based on the world density and the quality of the lighting and indirect lighting right oh uh, looking i'm looking at a close-up here of the shadow does seem to resolve very well on uh the faces here so i'm mm-hmm. assuming vsms as well 
I'd imagine this is the full package for UE5. Seems that way. Uh, another trailer that was also presented at primarily 60 FPS. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was kind of mixed, but yeah, mostly mixed, 60. Yeah, it was a bit mixed in some scenes. Uh, sometimes, like when I'm watching these videos, I'm like, "It's my browser being bad." Like, I, I you know, I, I don't always <laughs> download it, the video file to watch bad it. Bad browser. Bad browser. Um, but, <laughs> John. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I mean, here, so I wasn't such a big fan of the uh, last Outer Worlds game so much, mainly because it, I, I thought, like, some of the world scale issues annoyed me a little bit. Oh, uh, like, yeah, I know. I see yeah, you know, mean. like, you're like, I just couldn't, like, imagine people living in these areas. <laughs> and this is an old critique of, like, that goes back to a, a very old YouTube video by someone who doesn't post anymore named Mr. Bit Tongue. Yeah. Uh, uh, about kind of criticizing Bethesda games in general for la- having this lack of believability for world size. And it's something that actually New Vegas did better. But uh, I, when I was playing the uh, the Outer Worlds, I just kept thinking, like, there's no way people live here. And there's no way. Well, how are they surprised about, like, they have this little settlement. And then, like, outside the settlement, it's actually pretty small. But they're, like, surprised about things that are, like, just, like, a <laughs> couple meters away from them. I'm always, like, I just don't get the I, world look, scale uh, here. Uh, Alex, I know. I, I, I know. There, there's an argument, though, that this has done f- more for gameplay balance I, than I anything know. else. I, I understand I that know. concern. <laughs> but just modeling a realistic city does not necessarily I, I, yield enjoyable gameplay. I know. I know. But, it, like, always, it always just kind of makes me laugh. So, it, like, the worlds feel, like, smaller than they really arguably should. And, um... That's just a really minor critique, but like here, I had no sense of this of the world scale, so I can't critique it at all. Uh, but it's probably more interesting to me than their previous game, which to me, I mean, I got it, but I wasn't such a big fan of it. I'm more interested in the combat here than in the previous game. Uh, I did like that they emphasized that you can just kind of take up the role of any of like your classes of typical RPG things, like mage. Um, Battle mage. Mid range, yeah, the battle mage, lichdom battle mage. You, <laughs> you could do your like warrior class with the shield and be more brutal. Uh, I, I did like those things. Uh, I mean, it, it was it was fine looking. I, 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 you said the box art looked really great, but also at the same time, I was thinking like, oh man, imagine if it was even more stylized like the box art was. Oh, in game, like, yeah, yeah in game itself. Like, I mean, yeah, I get, get UE five, but you know, like, what if it was I don't even know. more? I feel stylized? like their use of color though is really strong here. Like, there's those scenes sure. with the with the sort of almost uh, the mineral rich water that has that reddish hue to it, contrasted against right. the landscape in the sky. It feels very bold in its color choices. Although mm. I just I just noticed that there seems to be SSR happening in this game. Yeah, it's, a, where he did the wand over the water, and you can kind of see the you can see the there. first the stuff, yeah, like the wand or the fire effect over the water in the one shot, like so where you see the something that's in the foreground being reflected in the background. So I guess SSR. we could assume then it's probably using the Lumen software reflections right. with SSR layered on top. Yeah, that that would be which makes sense. But yeah, but it, like one of the things like just use you use Lumen the, hardware, please for me. I, um, I know, <laughs> but uh, so like here, I was I think we probably put it at last because to talk about because it was maybe the thing we were least excited about. Um, generally based on the, on the presentation, yeah. I just I wasn't gelling as much with it as I was with almost every other title. I mean, Hellblade, I also wasn't so super big on, but I think it was there was more to talk about there. Yeah, so this is the yeah. case of a trailer that doesn't necessarily get you like super pumped, but you can expect that what they will make is going to be good. Yeah, yeah, is the yeah, way absolutely. I would Absolutely, and I think um, those who really love Obsidian games are probably all over it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Job done from that perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, in just in summary, uh, this was a really good presentation, and um, it's kind of refocused attention on Xbox because these days, well, there's something weird going on with this whole multi-platform stuff to the point where, you know, Phil Spencer isn't saying anything, but, you know, Satya Nadella is. Mm-hmm. We, we think that now we have the ability to really do what we've always set out to do, which is build great games and deliver them to folks across all platforms, right? So there's kind of like still this ambiguity about the future of Xbox. Well, I guess we'll talk about that a little bit in our next to- uh, topic. But at least this time, you know, with this presentation, the focus changed back to the games. And there was, what could I say, there's just some fantastic stuff there to look forward to. And it's all this year, right? Which is, um, you know, another bugbear that people usually have about these uh, kind of um, 
uh, event videos that that happen which is you know it's always sort of in the far flung future this is all stuff that's happening this year it's a really strong lineup i think um but with yeah, that indeed. i think we can uh, move on to the next news topic um so yeah i mean one thing which did emerge from the developer underscore direct was that um, Hellblade 2 is going to be a $50 game. It'll be on game, Games Pass, of course. Um, but also there was the announcement that there's not going to be a physical version of the game. There's not going to be a disc that you can buy. You cannot buy Hellblade as a disc, which um, on its own, you think, okay, fair enough. But what we're seeing now is another sort of um, example of what looks like a trend from Microsoft in actually something that could lead to the complete discontinuation of um, Xbox games on physical media. Now that sounds extreme, but remember the FTC leak where we actually saw previews of um, the refreshed Xbox Series X uh, machine that's allegedly coming sort of, um, I guess, towards the end of this year. Adorably all digital um, which is a phrase that's going to haunt Microsoft for a long, long time. And now we have this, which is, you know, no physical release for Hellblade. And um, just the kind of strategy in general that Microsoft seems to be pursuing in evolving its platform to be, I don't know, the way I see it is a kind of almost like a sort of um, their take on Steam, if you like, which, of course, is, doesn't have any physical media involved. Um, right. We wanted to talk about this specifically. You wanted to talk about this, John. So, I mean, it's not a great thing, is it? Uh, I mean, yes, I, I am disappointed by this, of course, and I've long had a history of supporting this sort of thing, uh, physical media specifically. I guess it's worth noting that with the original Hellblade that also started life as a digital-only game and did eventually receive uh, physical copies. Yeah. But I, I think it's fair to say that there is a trend on the Xbox side to move away from discs, uh, especially the series S is, is the console, which has a larger install base than series X. As far as we can tell, uh, we've seen that FTC thing, which suggests that they want to move towards a disc free, uh, Xbox series X as well. And frankly, um, I did raise this point on social media and there are others that agree with me and are disappointed by this, but at the same time, I've noticed that the Xbox community at large, not only do they not seem to care about this, they, they, they genuinely, there's a, there's a subset of people that get very nasty about this stuff. They are very angry when you bring up the fact that you're disappointed that there's not this option as well. And so, you know, I'm going to say this is, this will be one of the last times I want to talk about this because it's just not worth fighting this fight on the <laughs> Xbox side anymore. Like right. it's not the people that, are interested in physical media it will go elsewhere yeah and you know it just that this is how microsoft's choosing to make money i think and that's fine i think that's a their strategy is working the fans are completely on board with it and that's okay um and i guess it also another point that was raised is that xbox games so this physical media is not really about preservation to me specifically i think digital itself is actually more preservation it's the drm that's the issue right drm is what prevents preservation and that is a larger problem but then of course there's piracy to deal with which is a whole other can of worms right but i think with xbox games microsoft has at least chosen to launch all of them on pc as well and pc itself is an open platform there is a way if you know what I mean, to preserve most games on the PC. And for that, I am grateful that they continue to launch day and date on PC because that is, if I, if I am going to have to accept digital, I would rather do it on PC as a platform versus right. a console because all consoles are ultimately DRM locked boxes. Uh, with disc media and cartridges, even though it's technically true that, that you don't own the thing, right? You have full control over when you play that disc, unless the game, of course, is an online game relying on a server. And that's <laughs> kind of it, this ability to go back and producing DF Retro, I often pull in older consoles and the internet connectivity of the or the first generation, like PS3, 360, that is a gigantic pain in the butt to deal with when you pull them out and want to revisit older games. And I do find having the disc makes it much easier and more enjoyable to get back into stuff. 
So that's why I continue to pursue that myself. Um, but yeah, on PC, as long as we have PC, I think we're okay on that front. Whereas with Nintendo and Sony, there, there's other concerns there because not everything that... On Sony, some games come to PC. With Nintendo, I would say no games come to PC. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, And thankfully, their, their security hasn't exactly been robust, so to say the least. So if, if they had their way, entire generations of games on, like, say, the Wii would be gone forever. But right like yeah. right. the the e-shops until they want to yeah until they want to offer some virtual console version of them right you know right like a disney oh, no. Vault style it's, thing it's not just roms it's like original right. games like the the wii shop games like uh M2's, oh right uh rebirth series the Grad- gradius contra castlevania rebirth you can't buy those games anywhere they are not available for purchase and nintendo would make it impossible to access them again even if you did buy them uh but thanks to piracy the heroes in this case they have actually been saved uh which is good well they've actually rebuilt uh, the wii shop they have rebuilt the, the wii shop as a was it the re shop uh um, that's right is, the re shop which is basically exactly. you know they've rebuilt it as a you know but you don't pay for the games now you know the from a preservation perspective great but from a commercial perspective you know i do think and this there this is, is the problem here. is I feel like companies, it would be better for them to try to meet the customers somewhere in the middle here, yeah. right? People are forced to go to this level to gain access to these games, which shouldn't just disappear from existence. And if companies were more willing to meet their customers halfway, maybe this wouldn't be a problem. I mean, yeah. I would say uh, DRM aside, Xbox has admittedly done a good job with making many but not all of their old games available again uh which is great with their backwards compatibility program so i commend them for that i don't know this is it's such a complicated situation i understand business wise why microsoft would want to phase out discs uh especially given that they've been pushing game pass that's where they're making a lot of money i think their audience has largely accepted that that's the way they want to play their game I don't think they're going to stop offering digital sales either. It's some, I don't expect Game Pass to become the de facto method of accessing these games. Uh, it's just that they've chosen a different path and as far as the disc stuff goes, which, mm. yeah, I lament it, but I've I've learned to accept that that's what they want to do. And well, you've, you've also noticed, uh, especially in Germany, that, and I think it's also the case in the UK as well, that the actual physical presence of Xbox media in game shops is is kind of dwindling yeah they do still sell uh physical games here on shelves both at specialty stores and larger electronic stores i mean we're seeing them phase out in the u.s with like best buy kind of disappearing but xbox sections in particular have been mostly Hmm. evaporating like just they're gone or reduced to very few games uh which to me makes me wonder what do the retailers know are is it just them not ordering them or is it like Selling. Some other communication happening somewhere down the chain where it's like, hey, we're this is not what we're doing going forward. Uh, mm. Right. Yeah. I mean, I still think that there's a, a crucial role for physical media to play, which we haven't discussed, which is, um, well, you know, the classic arguments. Um, you don't own the game. You can't right. resell the game. Right. You can't share the games with your friends. If you think back to that classic E3 2013 the thing that sunk xbox one was that video of um you know uh, shui yoshida giving a game to, to somebody else and basically saying yeah that's how we share games on playstation 4 mm-hmm. you know that was that was basically a defining video for that generation that you know that just was the final nail in the coffin of um xbox's nascent plans to do exactly what they're doing now which is you know yeah. to to reduce um, or to change the way that people actually access games. Um, so, you know, that all of that stuff's going to be the preserve of um, PlayStation and Nintendo, seemingly. It's just, to me, it feels like a missed opportunity for them to capitalize on a certain subset of their fans, like option, at least offering like special editions or like versions of these games on the disc media. Or maybe what, you know, what if they transition to some sort of like uh, alternative drive system whether it's a usb stick uh they wouldn't do it but there's little ssds like i thought that would have been something like that would have been amazing expensive 
but I would have been willing to pay more for like uh, a game on some sort of media like well, that. We, well, we can assume that whatever Switch 2 is going to be isn't going to be uh, game carts as, as they are right now. They need a high bandwidth delivery system. Yeah, and more, yeah. more space is comparable to. Uh, I mean, it's going to be some sort of high end flash, I'm sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that would be a potential solution there. But I, I guess I'd like to know if you're out there listening to this and you're big, you know, primarily an Xbox player, do you care about having discs as something as an option for some users or would you prefer they just go away entirely and the system goes all digital? I'm actually curious to know what the what the larger population thinks, because I do see it kind of divided online. Some Xbox fans still very much want the option. Others seem to want it to go away. So uh, I'm actually curious, what is preventing the equivalent of made to order for a video game physicalized disc? Uh, they need to I, be I collect... made in bulk, right? Dude, Lost, that, like, I, I don't know. Like, I guess maybe they do, but like, uh, maybe, I don't know. I just feel like in the era of like 3D printing and of the fact that I've always been able to burn a disc in my gosh darn drive on my own computer, <laughs> I've always wondered <laughs> like, what? why can't you just have like a, a made to order disc version of a game? It could be pretty simple. It doesn't need to be special. So, like part what, of the, what is preventing this? Part of the problem though, Alex, I think is, uh, and this is unique to games versus other mediums because obviously music and films have shifted shifted largely digital right but blu-ray discs uh music cds vinyl records even cassette tapes they're still are... made and manufactured today oh, yeah they the are. difference there is that the hardware required to play them is not a closed standard so any company can make one of those and as long as there is some demand there will be a company making a device that can play that media but with a console, it's a lockdown system. Not anybody can make that. If the manufacturer doesn't provide a, a means uh, for playing physical media, then there is no option. It is impossible. Like the Series Xbox, X yeah. does have a disk drive, but if they no. follow those plans and phase <laughs> it out and, it, and the two machines on sale no longer have that as an option, uh, that's it. Right? No there, is, there is no vinyl record resurgence happening if the disk drive or the card reader or whatever is removed. Uh, yeah. And that's kind of, that's that's really the bummer with games that's different from other media, uh, yeah, I would well, say. That's, that's sad um, because it feels like it could be, there could be a boutique market there, but I guess not. I get what you're saying, Alex, yeah. because, you know, we could have a, a made to order digital foundry gosh darned t-shirt. Yeah, right. That's so true. why not again? You know. Yeah, I think there's something there's something going on here. I think there's um, a, definitely a transition period happening for Xbox at the moment, where they're wondering, you know, what's the plan going forward? Where do they want Xbox to be in five, ten years from now? And um, I don't think physical media is part of that equation. I honestly think they're eyeing Steam and wondering what they can do as their sort of take on it. And, um, you know, if you think about what's actually happening with Steam, you know, that they've got their own console now. So, you know, they're, they're kind of doing an Xbox in a certain, from a certain perspective. Do you know what I mean? Oh, and I, the thing about Steam Deck, though, is that it's still a PC, which means it is open and there are ways to get things into Steam that maybe <laughs> Valve does not directly offer. Well, maybe Same. this is maybe this is again part of the Xbox plan, right? I mean, you know, do they really yep. need heavy DRM? I, I honestly think, you know, I would hope no. I think they should be too. thinking about um, some sort of uh, preservation mechanism. You know, I think we were talking about this just before we started filming, John. Where, um, uh, you know, if you've got like ten-year-old games on your platform, remove the DRM. You know, yep. there's I nothing agree. to lose oh, by God. doing Get rid so. Of it. Yeah. Get, get rid of that DRM. Yeah, this kind of ties into what we talked about last week with like Microsoft themselves taking more of a Steam Deck approach with Xbox, where they build a version of Windows 11 that behaves like the Steam Deck game mode portion of its Linux distro. Mm. Uh, and it's a closed, polished platform that feels like a console, but is still fundamentally <laughs> a PC, allowing them to continue to offer Xbox consoles, but also exploring like the handheld space and basically changing the nature of what Xbox is to embrace the positive side of digital, because there is definitely positives there. So I think there is chance for some pretty cool things to be done in that space that I could be okay with. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just the platform right now kind of hangs in a weird spot where mm -hmm. 
you know what I mean. So yeah, I know exactly what you mean, John. Like for me, uh, we did talk about this before you started, but as soon as like the, I think a lot of people, as soon as it goes all digital, there's like you said earlier, there's going to be a lot of people who are just been like, okay, so why don't I just buy the PlayStation five version of that game? Maybe instead. And uh, I think that's going to end up happening to a degree for those people that don't want to migrate to PC or, you know, uh, for some reason are still invested in that Xbox ecosystem. Mm. At that point. I mean, yeah, I've, I have moved primarily to PC. Mm. I would say in the last year or so PC has become my main platform again, which hasn't been the case for a while, but there it is. I would like uh, to see some clarity on what these future plans are, because, you know, honestly, when I'm seeing these um, uh, statements from, Satya Nadella honestly feels like it's undermining the messaging that's coming from Phil and uh, there needs to be some clarity there to be honest and Mm -hmm. um, yeah oh with like the targeting the different platforms targeting the different platforms and just basically what is the vision for Xbox at this point because it's not really clear because the you know certainly the uh, the developer direct seemed to be mostly business as usual right you know Indiana Mm -hmm. Jones is going to be on um, Xbox and PC not PlayStation Exactly. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's, it's kind of conflicting signals there. Maybe it is just, you know, the ABK stuff that's multi-platform. Right. You know, who knows? We kind of need a bit of clarity there. I'm not really sure at the moment what Xbox stands for anymore, um, but only because of these rumors, right? And right. and the stuff that's happening on the acquisition side. I mean, what I will say is that, you know, if Microsoft has any more um, grand plans for um acquisitions on the scale of Bethesda or, or ABK, then oh my goodness. I kind of think they've got to be fully multi-platform at that point just to pass the regulatory hurdles that were faced with uh, with their most recent acquisition. But yeah, interesting stuff. Um, let's move on to the next news topic. Okay, so this week it was the release of The Last of Us Part Two uh, Remastered. Interesting reactions from the audience here, um, some overwhelmingly negative. And I think we should just plow on to um, support a Q&A here because we had a couple of questions about this. Uh, yeah. This one from the uh, ever awesome Dr. I. Krappenschitz. Um, regardless of the T. Lu 2 case on a more physical or philosophical level, do you think it's fair that games that are compiled for a different system, in other words, recompiled or remastered if we weren't talking about code, are labelled as such? Or do you think games labelled as remastered should be distinguishable from the original work? Unlike most uh, remastered music, for example. Um, So this is the key thing, right? Um, The Last of Us um, Part 2 Remastered, um, it does look, let's, let's face facts here, it looks very, very similar to the PlayStation 4 Pro version of the game. But significantly, there are enhancements that bring its visual feature set, certainly in terms of 4K modes and whatnot, uh, into complete parity with The Last of Us Part 1, uh, which is some, which is a point that was made by Naughty Dog on social media today. Um, I think, you know, there's been some sort of um, points being raised where maybe they should have been labelled like Director's Cut or something to sort of reduce expectation. I'm curious what you make of this, Alex, because... Um, mm. Typically, when you look at remastering on any other form of media, it's exactly what they've done here, <laughs> which yeah. is which is to yeah. say, you know, increased clarity, same core assets. And the thing that really sort of slightly annoys me about this sort of negative reaction is that, well, you know, it's not a $70 release, it's a $50 release. And if you already own the game, then, you know, it's a $10 upgrade. And more than that, yeah, and I actually saw a a tweet today where somebody who owned the PlayStation 4 version digitally, I presume, bought the version on PlayStation 5 and got a refund from Sony and, um, you know, uh, and uh, a note saying, hey, maybe you should consider the $10 upgrade instead. So, you know, assuming that's genuine, it kind of covers all all bases. I think I'm, I'm really not getting... It's optional. You don't have to buy this game. So I don't know. <laughs> For me, like what I, I think it's just in terms of naming, the, the, the there's no r- good consistency to the way these things are done in the video game market. I mean, The Last of Us Part 1 is called 
remastered even though it's a complete remake of the original game maybe there's some logic in there that's shared between the two and the level design layout but everything is different like all the assets are different you know like the naming it doesn't mean anything at this point and i think the reason why they call it the last of us part two remastered is for uh consistency in the naming between their most recent efforts uh it's i think it's all just about consistency um uh uh, I mean, it's, since it's a completely optional purchase, I, I I cannot get upset about it at all. I think in terms of maybe wanting a bit more, uh, one thing I would have maybe liked to have seen is they, they do adhere to a 1440p TAA presentation for their 60 FPS mode. And it seems to have enough headroom there. I, I think I would have liked to have seen maybe a little bit pushing there more in some aspects. I don't know what they would be necessarily. I would have maybe liked to have seen, I don't, maybe not FSR 2 because- They, they, fi they fixed the LODs. Uh, yeah, they fixed was, the LODs. So, yeah. you know, like, but you know, like, you know, maybe 4K FSR 2, if someone wants it as an option, that's going to be in the PC version when that comes out. Um, I don't know. Like, I, I can't get troubled with it. And I do find it a little bit funny that it is so, such a negative reaction. Um, especially for something cheap that you don't have to buy. Uh, I, <laughs> well, that's I just the don't thing, have yeah. to you buy know, it. You, you can stick with your physical version of The Last of Us or even a digital version of The Last of Us Part 2 and it will run at 60 frames per second on PlayStation 5, which is, you know, right. a crucial update. And it's free and it remains free and it hasn't, it's not going away or anything. So it's kind no. of shades of Ghost of Tsushima when that was ported over to PlayStation 5. Uh, John, right. what's your reaction to that react uh, to that remastered um, um, Monica? In a way, I, I think there's just so much confusion around the usage of the word remastered, yep. remake, and all those sorts of terms. Uh -huh. What does it actually mean? Uh, and I think the problem is is that it means different things to different people and different companies. So sometimes you'll see remastered applied to a game that has a gigantic visual overhaul. Other times it's more. Like, this is more in line, I guess, with, as you mentioned, the traditional meaning of remastered in regards to, like, film and music, where it's still recognizably the same product, uh, but with some minor changes to the overall presentation to bring it up to, to whatever spec they're targeting. And in a way, this is kind of effectively not that different from, say, The Last of Us remastered on PS4, right? Yeah. Which also basically the same game it's just that the leap felt larger there because the the gap in terms of what the visual target was and it's just ma mostly the same assets just higher resolution it actually runs well yeah. uh the last of us part two ran well on ps4 versus the last of us original on ps3 ran horribly and re remastered fixed that or this time it's just sort of like a more inc it feels more incremental because the game was already in a good state before. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really have a problem with its ex existence. I can't say it excites me in any way. It's just like okay, it's right. this game, but it's fine that it exists. Uh, my only complaint is that they nerfed the depth of field on distant scenery, <laughs> and I re I I gen that's enough that makes me not want to play this version over the original. Because I actually think that was a big part of the visual design, and I don't know why they got rid of it. And it just makes things look more shimmery in the background. That's a good uh, point. In motion that I don't like. So I think that was a step down. Okay, well, that's uh, something that's patchable. It is quite patchable. The rest, though, seems perfectly fine. And I mean, let's be honest here The Last of Us Part Two on PlayStation 4 is still a phenomenal looking game, right? I think it's such a good looking game that it well, still stands up against modern rasterized games that we see releasing even right absolutely. now. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's the thing I that I don't get about this. Right. First of all, you know, let's talk about the value side of things. Is this, if you've not played the game before, is this um, worth $50 if you're a PlayStation 5 owner? Well, yes, because the game is vast and it's the, the, the quality level of it is phenomenal. Um, so yes, I, I do think it's, it's although rich to be, as you noted, you can play the PS4 version at 60 frames per second. And if you buy the disc version, you, you can, can get, get it for like cheap. nothing. Yeah, Ten absolutely. Bucks, and that, uh, the crucially that option hasn't gone away, right? It's still you know, there. It exactly. can't go away. Or you can have the $10 upgrade and you know, all of those new display modes, the extra content, I'd begrudge 
um, saying, you know, that this is a ripoff or anything. But that said, this comment from Ishrak, I'm a little concerned about Naughty Dog. It's clear T. Lu Part 2 remastered and to a lesser extent T. Lu Part 1, which itself was a remaster of a remaster, a holding, <laughs> holding patterns to keep Naughty Dog financially viable as they fail to release any new games. I can't help but think that had... Uh, T. Lu being an Xbox title, this latest update would have been a free update uh, for current ah. gen consoles. And quite possibly, that has yeah. been a distinction between Microsoft and Sony, which is that you know the next gen updates that it did do, and some of them were quite significant, like you know Gears, Gears Five. Um, Wasn't the uh, but then also the Santa Monica just put out that God of War DLC, right? Which I think was free, yeah, and mm. largely considered more significant than this. Right. Although this also has new content in terms of gameplay stuff, so mm -hmm. it's not like it's just a visual update. Yeah, I I can't really see the uh, the issue here, um, to be honest, on any of these these grounds. To be honest, I don't really get it. Um, you know, if the older options had been yanked, you know, if that free patch for PlayStation Five disappeared, that would be highly problematic. Oh, yeah, that would be bad. We're in a similar sort of territory to where we were with. Uh, Ghost of Tsushima, where you know, if you had that patch for PS4 uh, Pro code running on PS5, that was absolutely fine, and it still was. But you know, nobody's forcing you to do it. In terms of this question about um, uh, Naughty Dog being financially viable, I guess maybe there is this sunk cost of the um, online game that's been canned. Um, but you that's know, a right. problem. Yeah. Um, but they are still working on other stuff. So I mean, I'm sure they've been working on whatever big single player things next. It's got to be the last of this, part three, right? surely. And oh, but still, like another. It's probably like four years away at this point, right? I don't probably. know. Who, who I, I, man, is as well made as these are. So I, I'm kind of feeling done with this last of us stuff it's too depressing <laughs> for me i don't know i mean yeah there's the last so time i loaded misery. it up it coincided with a very negative time in my life and now the game is kind of scarred for me where like just oh. looking at footage again makes me feel bad so like i don't know <laughs> if i can ever play this game again well yeah. look, <laughs> i think the one thing which we kind of need to bear in mind is that um well we're now three years into the current console generation we don't really know what the Naughty Dog engine is going to look like on, right. on PlayStation 5. Now, you could say we're looking at it right now with The Last of Us Part 2 Remastered, but if you go back to the you know the PS4 Pro era, PS4 era, um, you know, what they did with The Last of Us was kind of like completely different to what they did with Uncharted 4, you know, which was a properly built for the PS4 right. era game from the ground up. So, you know... I'm just kind of curious as to how many un, um, sort of uh, um, Naughty Dog games we're actually going to get this generation at this yeah, point. Probably one. <laughs> one. Not but also, I will say, though, you mentioned the, the Pro is interesting because for people that pick this up, perhaps the PS5 Professional will offer sort of the similar upgrades we saw when the PS4 Pro launched for prior games, right? I could see this being updated to include, say, play it native 4k at 60 or higher even maybe yeah as an option right that would be great yeah just unlocking the frame rates yeah um, just exactly mm -hmm. why not okay. which That's they fine. already kind of do in vrr mode right yes so, okay, which has sure. been a, a godsend by the way in so many games just having vrr more widely accepted it's it's a great thing mm -hmm. absolutely um i don't really have too much more to say about this i'm just kind of was added it to the docket to talk about it because I'm just kind of a bit bewildered. Actually, the one thing I did forget that is actually a significant upgrade are the loading times. Yeah. Uh, they are way longer on PS4, even when running on PS5. Uh, I think if you load from the menu, it takes like 16 seconds on PS5, <laughs> which still seems slow for PS5, but that same scene, also running on PS5 in the original game, Oliver clocked it as taking nearly two minutes. It was like a minute 36. So 16 Jeez. seconds versus, versus what are they a minute 36. Doing? My goodness. Right? So, <laughs> yeah. That, not that, I mean, the game is, is seamless when you play it normally, but if you're someone that wants to jump into different situations, chapters, play the action scenes, having a much uh, faster loading time makes a big difference. 
OK, let's move on to our next news uh, topic, which is actually kind of, again, another reaction to stuff that happened this week. Um, NVIDIA started the rollout of its RTX 40 series refresh and uh, the 4070 Super uh, launched. And um, yeah, we've got a few questions from supporters here following up on that. This one from uh, Yonder Vittles. Um, I'm not. I'm sure this is one of those references that's uh, going to be explained to me in the comments, but let's crack on. Uh, hello, gents. With the release of the RTX 4070 Super and the impending release of the rest of the quote-unquote Super line, I've been mulling over moving on from my trusty 3080. However, I've never been more confused on the merits of an upgrade than I am now. I've long used an 80 card of some sort, but the price of the 4080 is a little hard to swallow. How do you recommend a person navigates the current GPU offerings? Would the DLSS3 features of the 40 series make a change from a 3080 to a 4070 Super a quote unquote upgrade? Or is it better to just resign myself to the $300 price difference between what I paid for my wonderful 3080 and what they want for a 4080 Super? Man, Alex, this is a big one, isn't it? It's um, a hard one. It is, yeah. because I think fundamentally you need to ask the question of whether you feel the time is right for an upgrade. Do you feel that the 3080 is holding you back? I mean, possibly with the path-generated stuff, you know, path-tracing mm -hmm. path tracing stuff, frame gen would actually be a really interesting feature to have. That we actually had a couple of supporters uh, on our Discord side grade from the 3080 to the 4070 for the extra memory and the frame generation, right. which you know kind of makes sense if you you know you really want to play Cyberpunk past tracing. You really want to play those games with path tracing, the four four thousand series where you really want to be. But ultimately, sure. I don't think the 3080 is in any way obsolete at the moment, really. I mean, typically no. people hold on to their graphics cards for you know a few years. I suppose it has been a few years. <laughs> it's been a few, but I mean, there's some slight things here. Like, when did the 3080 launch actually? Was that 2020? 2020? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. We're, we're getting old. Um, we look at this. I, I feel like this is hard. Like, if really, just look at the games you're playing. If they are, if those experiences that are noticeably different on the 40 series cards um specifically the side grade that rich was talking about like but the 4070 super and maybe ti super um maybe they'd be in your wheelhouse what you'd want to do if if those are the games you really are looking forward to but they're already out right now and we don't have any announcements of games in the uh, in the mid to near term future where you say like Oh, you gotta have a RTX 4000 series to play this. It's a must play. You need a TI Super. You need a TI Super. Um, <laughs> you know, no, I would, no, you need a 4090 I, egregious. You need a 4090 egregious. egregious. I, I, for me, I would say uh, Yonder Vittles <laughs> that I don't see the huge upgrade necessity for you at this very moment. I think. I'm putting out a video soon enough about FSR2 modding on the RTX 3080 mainly, and you're getting, it's not the same quality as DLSS3 frame gen. I'm not going to lie about that, uh, but you know, you're getting upped performance. I show in the video like Pathway Cyberpunk running at it at, I don't know what your output resolution is. I honestly don't know Yonder Vittles. I showed it running at 1440p with- That's, uh, that's fair. That's fair, and you know, it could also I could also pump up the internal res a bit if I really wanted to. Um, I, I showed it at a lower internal resolution in the video, uh, just because I was trying to show like HFR footage. Um, but you know, like there are ways around these things thanks to modders, and I think maybe give those a try out first. Think what you th you know, see what you think about that. I don't see the huge necessity at the moment. And my gosh, what the, the next series of GPUs is, you'll be surprised, it's probably around the corner in some way that, like in between now and then, what games are coming out that are gonna spur you on, to, other than Alan Wake 2 and Cyberpunk? Like what games are coming out between now and then that are really like, you need an RTX 4000 series 4? Mm. I don't really know. 
Yeah, typically upgrades aren't from one generation to the next. There's like, you know, you, you go back to the one before that, I'd say. But ultimately, I think that the bottom line is that um, if you feel held back by your current card, um, I think you probably would need a 4080 to get both the right. improvement to performance because you're looking at like a 50% level improve, improvement to performance, which you won't get with a 4070 Super. And you get the fame generation and stuff like that. It does feel like a palpably different product. Whereas um, 4070 Super is like, you know, a 3080 Ti really with fame gen. And the 3080 Ti famously wasn't really that much better than the 3080. Yeah, it's uh, better, but not to the degree that would necess necessitated a $1,200 price point or whatever it was at right. the time. So, you know, ultimately, I think that's the... That's the that's the bottom line. Uh, let's go to this question from F to the G. Hey there, lads. I really yeah. enjoyed the 4070 Super comparison to the PS5 in the latest GPU review, but why didn't you also include an older, older RT-capable model like 2080, 2080 Ti, he's put here? It's the old <laughs> Ti versus Ti uh, conflict. It's a TI. Yeah. Um, I think it would make a really interesting comparison as it is. Uh, as it is still going somewhat strong, but also missing some state-of-the-art features. The 2080 Ti could also serve as an interesting baseline for those who haven't upgraded since before the Bitcoin slash COVID slash NVIDIA GPU craze. Thank you for this great and indeed weekly show. Um, yeah, I guess you could basically... Here's the thing, right? When you set up a new sort of test system, the amount of variables and, and comparison points that you can put into that test system is essentially infinite. So while you think a 2080 Ti is a really good uh, comparison point, and it is, another equally good one could have been the RX 6700 non-XT, which is basically, you know, a PS5 GPU, the closest you'll get in PC form. And then, you know, you just go from there. There's so many different variables you'd have. It's like, well, okay, going back to like RTX 4060, how close is that? You know, there's a lot of different stuff that you could you could factor in there. You've got to draw the line, particularly when you get like one week to review a GPU. And unlike Linus, and you know, we don't have a massive team in a, in a ginormous lab. in a ginormous lab uh, benchmarking everything. So we've got to kind of limit the data to some point. But you know, I guess the the, the relatively small scope of those PS5 comparisons is is such that if and when there is a bit of spare time, we can start to put in stuff like a 2080 Ti or a 6700 non-XT. I would love to see that Last of Us Part 1 benchmark, which which is abysmal on PC. It would be fascinating to see the closest equivalent PC GPU uh, actually running significantly slower than a actual PlayStation 5. Like I uh, said, Rich, that game, like they fixed it up a bunch, but like GPU-wise, it's still not Was there any actual... Um, I think you mentioned uplift. something about a async compute uh, yeah, well, as it was launched, I was uh, going through... Oh, my gosh, I'm forgetting their name all of a sudden. <sighs> I, I was trading... Uh, um, GPU captures, as in uh, traces, with running on an RX 6800 XT at the time. With I forget their name. I'm sorry. Forgive me if you're watching this. Uh, and we were looking through it, and I was like, I was looking at it on my end. I'm like, I'm not seeing any asynchronous compute used here at all in <laughs> The Last of Us on PC. And yeah, there was a lot of concurring there on their end as well, too. Uh, so, the, the like, one of the interesting things about The Last of Us is they, especially with uh, their presentations for the PlayStation 4 version of the game, is they, they used asynchronous compute so much um, on the Sony side of things, on the PlayStation console side of things, where they would purposefully slow down things on like the raster side, uh, the non-compute side, to leverage that as more overlap window for asynchronous compute to run. It was like super async compute heavy game. And on the PC version of it, it's like minuscule. It's just kind of funny because obviously uh, we come off like um, like our interview with uh, the, the team Ubisoft Massive behind uh, Avatar. And they're saying like, oh, we use asynchronous compute on every platform, a whole bunch of it. And that's a game that scales actually pretty pretty normalized in the PC mm -hmm. scale. Uh, like when you look at the GPUs that I was able to scrounge up there. Uh, so um, that's what I was a little bit worried about doing these PC 
to uh, console comparisons is that like not every port is as good as every other port. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but it's still a good baseline. I like that you included that in the review because you saw just the huge differential between something like Plague Tale. Um, you also did Cyberpunk and then that, Tilu, right? And yeah. you could just see how different they were in terms of, to be honest with you, a little bit of that there is quality. Yeah, so. basically the, the cromulent ports, you could <laughs> actually draw conclusions as, you know, as just how much of a leap the 4070 Super is. Um, but you know, you look at the last of us part one and it's, it's kind of like, yeah, something's definitely Gosh. wrong here. <laughs> something's wrong here. Yeah. Something's gone wrong. Um, we've got the, also this question from some guy person, which in your RTX 4070S review, you demonstrated how the 4070S is basically 2X the performance of a PS5, which is a great place to be. 4K 30 PS5 games turn into 4K 60 games on the 4070S. That's a great, easy story to sell. Do you think the 4070 Ti Supermax, <laughs> Supermax <laughs> Plus Ultra egregious, uh, <laughs> would have as good of a, would would have as good of a through line? I don't really think having 2.7x the performance of a PS5 really does you any good, and you only really see a big practical benefit if you are integer multipliers better than the PS5, you know, 2x 60 FPS etc etc do you see things that way or is, or is there something i'm missing no i don't think i don't think you're wrong there i think you've basically got a class of hardware which was i think we first kind of got there with the 3080 right where we had um the 2x uh scenario mm-hmm. and you know then you can factor in stuff like dlss which um, from an experiential side is kind of accelerating that still further. You know, obviously there is upscaling on the PS5, but DLSS is basically better, so which which again, you know, boosts the experience there. Um, you know, when you're looking at the Supermax or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, the difference between like 2.5x and 2.7x probably isn't going to be, you know, tremendous. Um, so yeah, but I just wanted to make the point in that review that the, now the mid range has reached the point where you get genuinely transformative experiences, not just from the two X, by the way, but also from you know the fact that you've got stuff like frame generation, you've got right. um, endeavors like Path Trace Cyberpunk, you know, um, mm-hmm. that, that that are viable on that, that are just completely unviable on a console. Can I uh, go in a different direction for a second? Sure. Me in the retro fanatic that i am you're talking about the last of us part one here what if you decided you know what i want to enjoy this game as if i were playing on a playstation 3 well thankfully i have a solution for you i'm looking at someone that has benchmarked uh the last of us part one running on a radeon 7 Uh, i have opted (laughs) for 720p output fsr2 performance mode so 360p using very low graphics settings oh my goodness uh, the gpu is sitting at 99 or 98 percent the entire time and the average frame rate is well it seems to vary but i've seen dips as low as 7 fps <laughs> jesus 3 fps you know what uh, uh so maybe it's even worse than the ps triple original like but what are you serious this is a radeon 7 it's a Radeon 7, yeah. And it's running that And poorly? they're running on a Ryzen 5 5500U. Right, okay, well, that's that's going to have still... Awesome. That's it, also going to be... But, but be the CPU is mostly, like, under 8 or under 90% usage, mm. and it's just the GPU is, like, maxed out Yeah, the you're saying, time. like, the GPU is actually maxed, but that's... They put it at the <laughs> lowest possible settings. That's kind of embarrassing, honestly. Um, By the way, they, the channel is, like, Tanuj... I, I'm sorry, I can't say it's Gaminator or something. <laughs> I and I just, I just searched for this. Link I was this. curious, and he's totally doing... Uh, Radeon 7 benchmark so here come, here's the link for you but well, okay. well, I'm just completely amused by this because it looks absolutely terrible but it should be doing a lot be, better it should be doing a lot better that's what like Rich said even with that Ryzen 5 um even, uh, Ryzen 5 should still be doing better than that though Rich like way better <laughs> Ra- Radeon 7 is kind of bore it was it was comparable to uh, like a 2080 so that should be sort of within touching PS5. distance of a PS5 so, Okay, so the first part of the video, scenario, right? he's running yeah. it at very low preset, but native 720p. And as you can see, it averages about 19 frames per second. <laughs> okay. 
I mean, it's, maybe it's because it's drop driver support. I have no idea, but that's like that's really bad. You that's, can see that's, that's so uh, it's 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 bad. It's real bad, okay. but funny. I I enjoy this. I so yeah. I, I guess you, that gives us an idea. You've got a thing for these uh, AMD flagships the, of yore, haven't you? The Fury <laughs> X. You love I, it. I love the Fury. <laughs> no, it's just there's something about uh, watching what was once considered like a, a flagship product just kind of like the watching yeah. how it drops off right and yeah. it does seem to happen like really big with some of these old flagships like this. the 2080 would do all right on that on that game right Not great right. well you, you know obviously you'd be using dlss i guess but even so it should even at native resolution it would do better than 720p I, exactly. so. i'm just amused i guess that's the question is i'm wondering why these graphics cards where when you look at what they actually are it feels They're like huge. Yeah. it should be better than this and so what's happened? Is it a driver issue? Is there something else going? Like, what's going on that makes them, I, like, drop off a cliff, basically? I want to really say that, like, uh, this is not a great port to, to be mean, looking yes, at these we, side of things. Like, yeah. we did say it was very improved, but even that video, I said, you're right, like, you're right. I was like, man, that GPU side, I, though. I got to yeah. say, though, Arkham Knight used to be this sort of, like, the equivalent of this game. Like, all that game runs like garbage on the PC. So seeing that running, like, so well on a Steam Deck kind of blows my mind you're just like it doesn't feel like it should work but it does right, one last okay. tangent one do, last tangent sorry, one sorry. Last... I, i've got to i've got to intervene john has made an error here <laughs> what it's vega 7 which is but, uh, but if you look in his uh oh description did, if you look in his description it says the amd radeon 7 no 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 i think he's made a mistake here because the uh, radeon 7 had 16 gigs of memory it didn't have four gigs i think this vega. is uh, this is integrated so, okay. graphics this I did. It. I did. I did a search for Radeon, Radeon 7. Seven. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I can see the con uh, the confusion there. Vega Seven isn't Radeon Seven. I, it was when you flagged the fifty five hundred U. I mean, that's a laptop chip. Um, oh, oh, so it's a laptop system. Yeah. So this is an integrated graphics and. Um, no. Oh man. Oh no. no. So, so yes. So your okay, your so argument's been blown out the water there. My my <laughs> argument. I am. I am now. You're yes, chastened. Been... You're chastened and bowed. I have been owned, <laughs> po pwned even. You've been but pwned, now, you know, yeah. But you know what this means now, Rich. But I've got to I, test it on the, I, on the I need you to, on 7. We got to come back next week with actual proper <laughs> Radeon 7 <laughs> tests. 7 on The Last of Us? Oh, it's going to be really bad still, though. It's not going to be good. But uh, like, it won't be 7 FPS and 720p very low. I, um Okay, we, but in terms of up for reals. one last one last tangent is though I do kind of want to see the original Titan uh, running some more modern games at some point in the future. I can do you one better. I've got the Titan Black. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Which that's the I've full got chip. Off eBay. Yeah, it's the Wait, full isn't that, version. Is that the full chip? It is the full um, GK one hundred and two. Yeah, can we, can we do an original Titan versus? I don't know what would be a good GPU to put against the the original Titan. Well, the modern equivalent would be the 4090. Yeah, it'd be, uh, it'd be amazing to see 10x, 20x performance multiplier or whatever it's going to be. What it's was the AMD equivalent to the... Uh, it would be the uh, 290x. Um, the 290x, right. Or 295x2 because that, of the time yeah, that, period. Yeah, that that's when you had uh, yeah, the, yes. dual, the dual <laughs> GPU version of that. Yeah. That was a monster. I, I love. It was delivered oh, in man. like a wooden box. I seem to <laughs> do you don't have one of those, do you? I might actually start um, set, up, set up an eBay search for that because yeah. uh, <laughs> it, was a, it, was, it was a remarkable beast. Just yeah, I'm actually it's yeah pretty famous I GPU. I freaking love this stuff. Yeah, I want to see this. Uh, and yeah, we should the, do it. Uh, the old dual uh, GPU in one card. Mm -hmm. oh, they man, also did that with the Titan Z, right? The, the yeah, Titan Z. The Titan Z. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, okay, like, that's a three thousand. Like, like the Smack Z. That's, that's like the funniest GPU kind of ever. Want, even though yeah. it was not great, I think it was no. like wasn't it like two two six eighties in a. SLI, I don't know. I'm, I'm yeah, going all right, we're, get, we're going to... We're way off. Final, right. final question here about um, about the Supers. Hey, Super DF team, with NVIDIA releasing the Super Series, I've noticed a lot, a lot of discourse pertaining to AMD and how they will, uh, sorry, have slash will react with possible price cuts. It got me thinking, while I huh. commend AMD for making their FSR open source, I also believe that the only way they can compete is to differentiate themselves by making a proprietary feature and be the first to market akin to NVIDIA with DLSS thoughts. The problem is installed base. If you're making this technology and basically nobody only 
you know, only the very latest GPUs from AMD can use it, you don't have the market penetration to, to actually make the investment worthwhile. Uh, I think that's the bottom line. And it kind of goes against the philosophy that AMD have set up, which is to, you know, GPU open. It's to make everything work on everything, which I think is, if you're not the market leader with an 80 to 90% market mm -hmm. share, it's, it's actually a very laudable thing to be doing. But what, what do you think um, AMD could do on this one, Alex? I mean, something, the thing is, you know, when you look at DLSS, that wasn't a game changer day one. It required like an iteration to actually become something desirable. No. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I would, I would love to see them push for something very new. I mean, they do have some proprietary technologies in their driver. The most recent one would be AFMF. Yep. You know, they've got Hyper RX, Radeon Chill. These are things that have value add to users who are using their GPUs. And for some of them, for a while, anti lag was for the most recent GPUs. We'll see whatever happens with that now in the future. Um, I, I think they could keep going in that route, making their driver have more interesting features. I would actually like to see that. Um, but I think they do actually need to push on price performance more than proprietary things. Just like Rich said, just because with their minimal install base, convincing developers to use a non-open technology, unlike for NVIDIA where there's so many installed users that it's almost a no-brainer at that point to even put in the black boxes, which not everyone's happy with. Um, then, yeah, I think they should just really focus on price performance and make sure Intel doesn't eat their lunch at some point in the future. Um, just in case, because, you know, Intel is going to be putting out new GPUs soon. Uh, I actually do think they're a semi-threat to AMD's current position in the marketplace, even though they're still like way behind in a lot of number of aspects, because they only have things to gain at this point, and AMD has market position to lose, so... Yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah, and also, yeah. they've made the right calls technologically. I mean, um, uh, they're fully in on ray tracing and machine learning, and um, that's, that's particularly the machine learning side of part of the, the equation is going to become crucial over the next few years. And again, go right. back to that Microsoft FTC leak, and you know they're talking about their next generation consoles having machine learning. Nvidia's blazed a trail there, and um, it's a good thing to have. And I think Intel have made the right calls there. Right, totally. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, yeah. I mean, that's really all we've got to say. More super reviews to come, obviously. Super. We've got the 4070 super, super. Ti <laughs> Supermax. Super. Uh, they, they would be the 4080 Egregious. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, we'll we'll obviously be following up with those reviews as and when. Um, but let's move on. Okay, final news topic of the week. And uh, John, you've been playing Bulletstorm VR, um, I'm assuming on MetaQuest, right? Yeah, but How for less it? than less than two hours which is key because i am going to seek a refund for this wow. uh, i am not happy with this version of bulletstorm i think they've completely messed it up uh basically i love i love bulletstorm i think it's a fantastic game and i had skepticism that it could be translated to vr and the ske skepticism i think is warranted uh because in the end the i don't think it feels very good in vr uh, the way the camera moves, the way everything interacts and works, it all feels flimsy. In fact, it feels so flimsy that I, I kept like thinking, like, did they, I was looking through information on the game. Did they like rebuild this in Unity or something? Because it doesn't feel like Bulletstorm anymore. <laughs> what, an Unreal game rebuilt in Unity? That's That'd what it hilarious. feels, that's genuinely what it feels like. I, I don't, not to knock Unity, I'm just saying it has that feeling of transplanting assets to some other engine, which, by the way, actually worked super well with the Resident Evil 4 VR release on the standalone True. headset. That felt awesome, and that was a different engine. But this one... So, first of all, um, it, while it sometimes works on the Quest, at least, they went with the uh, sort of the this asynchronous space warp to a, a target a lower frame rate and reproject it up to a higher frame rate. But in this case, I don't think it works very well. 
Oh, uh, your weapon always has like a laser pointer. And just when you move an object's clear near your face, you get that double image effect all over. They also don't completely stick the landing in terms of frame rate consistency. So the motion is not as, it's kind of juddery looking, mm. uh, to avoid motion sickness. The movement of the characters feels very stiff, but it doesn't feel like bullet storm and things like the way you interact, obviously the like kicking enemies is a big part of it. The sliding, all of this stuff. Like when you kick, you just see like a boot just like appear in the middle of the screen and like do the <laughs> kick animation, then disappear. It feels really weird. Uh, yeah. The sliding feels wrong. Like everything about just the experience feels completely weird. And then on top of that, all the game's cutscenes, which were previously real time, every cutscene has been redone as an FMV scene that you stand in the middle of like one of those. It's basically like a texture floor, and you watch a projection of the cutscene. <laughs> And not only does that suck, but the actual <laughs> video quality is horrendous. It looks so ugly. Uh, Resident Evil 4 actually takes this standing in the room approach for its cutscenes because they were not also not designed for VR, but those were done at the game frame rate in real time. And you were basically watch. It's like you're watching it within a cinema. Mm -hmm. uh, here they made this like really ugly, low quality videos that are, that are incorrectly scaled. So they look super jagged and broken and they don't play smoothly either. So it just kind of ruins that. Um, <laughs> wow. Like everything, about, like the weapon scale and the scale of your hands, like your, the hands of your character feels like they're twice the size of a normal human hand. And the weapons themselves are like exceptionally bulbous and they don't look or feel right. Uh, everything about it just like to, I need to go look and actually compare, but it looks visually somehow worse than the 360 original. Okay. Version. Well, that like, is, that's an interesting late UE3 title. Also late UE3 title. Now at the same yeah. time being UE3, UE3 does not really support VR properly mm -hmm. as far as I know. So they would have had to done something. Did they port it to UE4? Is it unity? Is it something else? Did they shoehorn some kind of UE3 project into VR for whatever they did? Unlike many other VR releases I've played as of late, it does not feel good to play at all. And it's honestly, I after like 20 minutes, uh, I had to just turn it off and I closed it and immediately investigated with Google, like how to refund MetaQuest games. Right. Because uh, they're charging 40 bucks for this thing. Wow. And I wasted what? 40 bucks on this damn thing. And uh, I will be getting that back. That's the, okay. I so rarely would spend that kind of money on a digital game at all. Uh, but VR is like that's you know it is what it is. That's space, but, but th th that's highway robbery. I, I <laughs> frankly, now to be fair, I think it's also coming to other platforms, and I'd be curious to see if it is more enjoyable on like say the PSVR two. Like, is it a more competent game technically? Like, to me, it almost feels like I'm just playing the Quest two version on the Quest three without any of the Quest three enhancements. It looks mm -hmm. much worse than your typical Quest three game. It runs worse. Uh, when you look at what other companies have been doing lately with the quest, and then you look at this, it's like something went wrong. That's I've only got one question, uh, yeah. John. Uh, this is a vintage 2011 Unreal Engine 3 game. Um, yeah. But it saw the debut of Epic's uh, Light Shaft slash God Ray technology. Oh, yeah. oh yes. The Does it have Light ones. Shafts? Does it have it? I think it does. Right. So, I, so it's a one I, up over the PS3 version. Though. Yeah, the PS3 version did not have the light shafts. I remember that. <laughs> God, PS3 that was, was so pretty bad. darn funny. Uh, like, even Halo 1 on the OG Xbox has this. Like, come on, PS3. Come on. But but yeah, I, I hope they fix this. Because as it is, I think it's just not not well done. Uh, it's It's definitely the least exciting VR thing to come out in a while. That's a shame because Bulletstorm deserves better. But at the same time, I think just a lot of the energy of a game like this was actually tied around the camera work, the way the camera and the melee and like the first person view model worked within that game and how it connected with enemies. I think when you put this into VR and you take all that momentum and animation and everything kind of out, it just breaks the core feel of the game. Right. And that's... Okay. The only thing I will say is that the actual, the laser whip thing actually feels good in VR. Cause you know, you're like almost doing the half-life Alex style thing, reaching out, except for it's projected from the laser whip. That looks cool. Everything else though, it's not good right now. So unless they drastically fix this, uh, I would avoid. Okay. 
Fair enough. So I'm seeing this online. I'm watching it. I couldn't remember. Bulletstorm, you're right about it being attached to the camera. When you do the slide in the game, it actually changes the camera FOV to make Correct. it seem faster. There's, there's a lot a, of things. There's there. a lot of things with the FOV and lots of camera movement and tweaks, and all of it's gone. And, uh, yeah, it hurts. Okay, well, that's a downer to end our news topics on for this week, John. I know. Thanks for that. Know. It's all right. sorry. We'll Good luck it. with uh, the refund. Just, the... I know. I'm going to try. Okay, uh, let's move on to supporter Q&A, the part of the show where every week we uh, petition our supporters for, uh, you know, things that they'd like to know, and we do our best to answer them in DF Direct Weekly. Um, this week, we've kind of answered a lot of questions already, so it's going to be a bit of a shorter um, uh, episode, or segue, okay. rather. Let's crack on. This one from Luke. Hey, gang, how much horse, uh, sorry, how much manpower does it need to implement proper 60 FPS patches for consoles? You showed in your modded PS5 that it's easily achievable with games like Red Dead Redemption 2. So why why don't companies, or why doesn't, I think it's a slight typo there. Basically, why don't uh, companies give us what we want? I'd assume it's even cheaper to produce than a quote-unquote GTA-like quote-unquote remaster, considering <laughs> testing and marketing, for example. These newer consoles are already PC-like. So why isn't it, for some games, as easy as flipping a switch? So this is referring to the video I did in collaboration with Illusion, who uh, produces mods for PlayStation 4 games that work on exploited consoles and um, basically uh, unlock the frame rate. And you can run those mods on exploited PS4 Pro, PS4 and PS5 consoles. And obviously with the PS5, you have the uh, backwards compatibility horsepower that propels those games up to 60 frames per second. Um, and in some cases, it is as simple as uh, removing a call to Sony's system library for half a rate VSync. And there's actually a, a mod that Illusion has done now, which will do that on any game that is uh, running on PlayStation 4 slash 5. Uh, the issue being that, you know, maybe it doesn't use that system call. So it only work on some games. So that is an example of like um, how it is literally like flipping a switch. Um, the thing is, to answer this question, you've got to understand the hoops that developers have got to jump through in order to get a game onto the store. And that means, you know, they need to be using Sony's official cross-platform um, SDK rather than, you know, on-the-fly hacks or mods. And um, that actually was one of the major reasons why a lot of games couldn't get 60 FPS upgrades because the games were old. They weren't built on the latest in, uh, development environments. So it isn't just flipping a switch at that point. It's actually porting a game over to, to a new development environment, which isn't trivial. And I think I mentioned, uh, I think it was actually in the accompanying Eurogamer article, uh, not going to mention the developer, but one of the reasons they were able to, um, uh, to to produce a 60 FPS patch was that they hadn't u actually updated their development kits. They had one in storage that was still running on the very very old right, right. development environment. I remember and, that. And they could produce like a like a heuristic that you know figured out whether it was actually running on hardware that was faster than a PS4, and then unlock the frame rate. But there's a lot of hoops to jump through. And I think, I think, as I said in the video, um, uh, it's something that Sony could possibly do at the operating system level, which is exactly what Illusion's done with that um, ability to basically turn off the system call for a 30 FPS cap. But some games have their own caps. Um, Batman Arkham Knight, you saw in that video, actually had two caps. 59 FPS. 59 FPS cap. D double caps. I know so, why it's doing that. It's the smooth command. It's probably right. the B smooth frame rate yeah, command yeah. in Unreal, Unreal Engine. Smooth it's thing. probably that. That one's Garbo. That's a bad yeah. command, by the way. I don't think there's yeah, much for you guys to add to that. But, you know, nope. I, I do think that, you know, if there is a route forward for making more PS4 games run at 60 FPS... I do think it's probably worth doing because it completely transforms the feel of the game and it's going to drive sales. And if the, you know, if it is a, a case of being relatively simple to do from a developmental perspective, it's worth doing. I mean, Just Cause 3, it ran terribly on PlayStation oh, yeah. 4, like sub 20 FPS in some scenarios. You know, with this testing that we did, we saw that on a PS5, remove the frame rate cap, it's basically lock 60 no matter what. It's awesome. It's nuts. I mean, this is a real golden opportunity to 
not just have backwards compatibility to but actually to refresh some really great games um, because otherwise they remain locked at 30. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's that. Uh, let's move on to the next question. This one from James Dean. Hey, DF team, exclamation point. Looking back at 2023 with examples such as Alan Wake 2, Avatar and Resident Evil 4 Remake, was 2023 the year of the in-house engine? How much work is needed to get consistent, stutter-free and scalable performance from UE5? Much love from a fellow AC Unity fan. Alex? <laughs> Um, I mean, yeah, uh, I would also say this was a year that we saw, um, Cyberpunk. I actually loved it uh, oh. in terms of seeing all those things like Northlight and Ubisoft Massive, uh, and getting genuinely pretty much stutter free experiences in all those games that I did talk about towards the latter half of the year there. Really happy about that. Um, and I think the the aspect of getting Unreal Engine to be stutter free is about taking it serious uh, with the current version of the engine. Future versions of the engines that I talked before about on the channel, UE 5.4 and above, are still completely unknown as to how they perform. But the promises there are great uh, because it's a genuinely changing of the fundamental architecture of how UE 5 spreads its load, processing load up across CPU cores, as well as how like work submissions done. So it could be dramatically different and we could actually not be having this conversation at all in the latter half of 2024 or in the years beyond that. But I think in the, if you're working on a current version of Unreal Engine 5 to make it stutter free, you're going to be, you're going to have to target that at the beginning of your development. You cannot just like, it's too many developers are caught with their pants down uh, towards the end of development realizing like, oh my God, this game is just stuttering like crazy on uh pc uh also i would say they're still not stuttering they're still stuttering to a degree on the, the consoles like we've saw with lords of the fallen the xbox and playstation versions of those games still had uh traversal stutter and even the xbox had some other level of stutter that was going on at some point that might had to have been done you know had to do with like running out of memory it's really hard to know um but uh like yeah you have to just you cannot just put the game out and it will not stutter on Unreal Engine 5 currently right now. It does require like high, heavy targeting to make sure it's a super smooth experience the entire way through. Do you think it was the uh, last hurrah of the homegrown engine, John? I mean, you know, you could actually add the uh, red engine to that with RT Overdrive, which was just absolutely phenomenal in 2023. Wait, the last hurrah that implies that that's going away? I don't think it's going away at all. Well, the Unreal think, Engine 5 is becoming... Yeah, un, but Unreal Engine 4 was ubiquitous as well. I think... To the same I think we're still seeing it. I think we're still going to see plenty of companies stick with in-house engines. I think some will move away from it. We've seen it with Deck 13, obviously a smaller studio, but they're leaving Fledge behind for Unreal. Uh, TD Project here's, Red. Here's the thing, That's though, the that, I, that, that we often hear uh, talking to developers is like there's a, there's a cert, certain subset of engineers that get into this industry and they want to work on their own technology. They don't want to work on Unreal. And a lot of those guys are some of the smartest minds in the rendering area as well on other aspects of, of like the technical side of game making. And I gather that a lot of them are disincentivized from wanting to necessarily go work at an Unreal based studio. Uh, unless, you know, if you're at something like, say, the Coalition, right, which has a very special relationship with Epic, and they're clearly pushing that engine in very unique ways, that's an exception. Uh, but I think a lot of people will still want to continue to work on proprietary technology. And I think we're going to continue to see it, uh, especially in companies that have, you know, do you expect Capcom, for instance, to go away from the Reach for the Moon engine and go to Unreal anytime soon? I sure don't. It doesn't make yeah. sense for them. I think companies like that, I think EA, Ubisoft, all of them will largely stick to their in-house engines with exceptions here and there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think smaller, I think it's more like, well, maybe not even in the mid, the mid budget or smaller games, there are still some projects where you see unique coding, like, like rebellion. That's what I was rebellions thinking. there. Uh, something like uh, Penny's big breakaway, which I, plan to cover this year in a big way because it's exciting it's evening stars christian whitehead's own like it's all their internal in-house tech right and they're a small studio 
but they're doing very specific things with their engine rather than just jumping over to like Unity or something. And I think that's really cool. So I think we'll continue to see proprietary tech as long as there's programmers that want to make it. <laughs> mm, I'm I'm still concerned because, um, you know, a, a lot of the really sort of, uh, you know, the, the genius level guys are actually going to work for NVIDIA Epic and, you know, AMD, you know, it's, it's, and there's layoffs happening. And there's, and there's layoffs <laughs> happening, of course, yeah. Jesus. But, you know, there's always going to be a home for those those super high-end guys at those particular companies, and particularly if the direction of travel is towards Unreal Engine, which, you know, there's, there's you know, so many developers seemingly moving away from their own stuff. It's, I don't know. I guess we'll just need to wait and see. Yeah, I'd like, like with Rich saying earlier, the companies that did move away in the last three, four years, like I, it was sad to see, even though I think it was pretty all right, the new Talos principle not using the Sirius engine. It's like, I don't know. Yeah, in some really, cases it really works. Really weird. Yeah, it works fine enough, but it's also like, I, I just don't get ex- nearly as excited. And that's so like, when you were talking about Cell- Hellblade earlier coming yeah. out, like I'm honestly less excited about it because it's unreal as boring as that is as alex is i mean i I should be excited about good graphics in general but it's like if i know how they're made i was was just using that night it's also weird that like the talus principle i love the original talus principle especially in vr and i have not bought the second one it is actually just due to like just being unreal slightly reduces my interest in it in a way where i'm just like like i'll play i'll wait for a steam sale or like yeah, the, I mean, at some point yeah. in the future like i still want to play the game i'm sure the game is good and ultimately the game is what's most important don't get me wrong but when it's a game that i'm like mildly interested in that's enough to kind of push me over to feel like yeah well whatever yeah, yeah it's, it's not like, really you know, interesting tech wise to me at this point yeah I, I agree with that. But yeah, obviously, I don't want to slight every game. Not no. everyone can do this. So, But uh, for certain games, it's just like a little less interesting to me as a result. It's like in that case, it's like Crow Team's history and what they've done. You know, it just yeah, feels, it feels it's right. weird yeah. and wrong. I don't know. It does feel weird. Okay, let's move on to our final question. Um, this one from Gatti. Will this year be the year of the Linux for gaming? <laughs> what? <laughs> I think he basically means, is this the year that Linux is actually going to make an impact in gaming? I'd argue that it actually started with Steam Deck, but I yeah. don't know. Alex, what do you think? It's the Steam Deck. It was all the yep. Steam Deck. And it had almost nothing to do with Linux's core principles at that no. point in time because it's a like a proprieta- proprietary <laughs> piece of software. I mean, it is. It's like their Steam OS and it's like their you know architecting everything around a, a specific set of hardware which is not very linux like to me uh but if they're using it as the basis uh and it's like actually unifying it into a model that is workable user friendly uh has great cross plat has great like windows support support for things that run on windows uh, and it's increasing over time so i would say that's it and i would say but it is not a desktop pc uh, you can r- roll it that way, but I don't think that's the way it's it's best. Um, so I would still say we're waiting for the year of the, the Linux desktop. <laughs> the year of the Linux. <laughs> well, John, you were a recent convert to, uh, yeah, to, to the Steam Deck. So uh, what do you make of this? I mean, I, I think what Alex said is right. I don't think it's going to, nothing's going to move on that front. And the parts of the Steam Deck that make it great are proprietary anyway. But I will say... <laughs> Putting the Steam Deck in the dock and using it on the same monitor as my normal PC in desktop mode, I'm still impressed by how fast and responsive it actually is. And I spent some time this week just using the Linux on the Steam Deck on my monitor uh, for things. And it was like, yeah, this is actually uh, how, this is a pretty good experience. What is that dock? And are you using like KVM built into the monitor? Like, what is this? How, how are you doing it if you did oh. use it? No, it's just, there's many docs, but it's USB-C okay. based and it's just dropped in there. And the way I did is, um, so I just have a secondary input on the monitor connected to that HDMI port on the dock. And, uh, my keyboard has both a dongle and Bluetooth. So I use the dongle on my main PC and then I just hit the Bluetooth button and it switches to the deck. That's cute. Uh, yeah, so that's basically it's like its own KVM and I have two of these, uh, G900 mice, so I use one for my main PC and another on the deck. So okay. if I need to do that, and it works that sounds cool. well, and it's good. So Well, I don't know. I'm quite liking the idea that Linux should be called the Linux. Yeah, games like the, the, the definite Linux. article. It could be the, the other year, Linus. The year of the Linux, as in 
that. <laughs> that. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Maybe, Definitely. Rich, maybe, has, has anybody made a YouTube channel called Linux Tech Tips yet? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be there. Oh dear. Okay, well, that was the final question. Therefore, the end of this marathon show. Uh, please do like, subscribe, share if you enjoyed it. Ring the bell for things that may or may not happen in terms of notifications. Uh, DF Supporter Program, join us. Join our amazing community. Uh, high quality video downloads, everything we do. Um, and all the other stuff. Early access to DF Direct Weekly. The chance to contribute to DF Direct Weekly. Bonus material, early access of other stuff, etc., etc store.digitalfoundry.net for our merchandising wares. Um, But that's all from us this week. See you next week.